Hello, welcome to our uh, St. Cloud Orthopedics uh, annual conference, uh, Musculoskeletal uh, Care for Primary Care. Uh, we'd like to welcome you this year virtually into the St. Cloud Orthopedics boardroom. Uh, we'd love to come to you uh, uh, live for our annual conference. Unfortunately, that's not possible this year with the pandemic. It certainly has turned all of our lives upside down and we're feeling the effects and, and this is no doubt affected by it. Uh, the good news, though, is, is that we can make this not only a live event uh, for tonight, but this is also going to be recorded, and it's going to be a, what we call an enduring uh, CME event, where the, this uh, recording will be available uh, through our website uh, throughout the next year until the next annual meeting. And so at any point in time, any other learner can, can uh, uh, sign up for the event, watch the webinar and also receive four uh, CME uh, hours uh, of credit uh, uh, at their, uh, really at their leisure. Uh, so uh, a couple things that uh, just for you to be aware of as far as what to expect, uh, you should be getting an email, and this is for the live learners here today, uh, you should be getting an email and that will come more than likely either tomorrow or the next day and that will have what's called our learner notification. On it, it will say several things. Number one, we did not get any commercial support for this event. It'll also show uh, that there are, that we have accreditation for four CME hours associated with this event. Um, there also, uh, uh, there will be a, uh, a disclosure uh, for, all, for all the uh, speakers on there. Um, there will be, uh, there will be the objective and the main objective for this whole uh, course is to understand and to ev the evaluation and treatment of common uh, orthopedic and musculoskeletal issues. Uh, finally, and the most importantly, is this will be the, there, on the bottom of that learner notification will be an, a link uh, to the evaluation for this course. The important part about that is, is that you need to fill out the evaluation and once you fill out the evaluation, that gets submitted to our CME accreditation body. Once they get that uh, evaluation, they will uh, uh, give you a, a certificate for the, for the four CME hours, uh, and you can use that uh, as you need to. But the CME cannot be distributed unless we get that uh, evaluation. So I just encourage you to check out that email about the uh, learner notification and, and complete the evaluation and we can make sure that you get credit for this time with us. Uh, my name is Mitch Cool. I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon uh, and I'll be your moderator tonight uh, for this event. Uh, so you will see me here, um, but you also see me, uh, hear me more on the sidelines as we go uh, from speaker to speaker throughout the evening. Uh, given where we are, our location and the, the distance, uh, distance uh, uh, requirements, uh, we will be separated and so it, it would just be easier from a camera standpoint uh, for, for us to have this set up. There will be a small change as far as the uh, agenda goes. We will still have the same three speakers before 7 o'clock and the same three speakers after 7 o'clock, but we will have a question and answer session uh, at the end of each talk. So it will be a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, with me and the uh, presenter each time. For each presenter, if you have questions, and I encourage you to have questions uh, from a live uh, uh, audience standpoint, um, the way you uh, uh, present a question is to, to type it in and then submit it to me. I'll be sitting at, uh, at a computer off to the side here, and I will be able to see those questions, uh, kind of uh, keep them, uh, uh, to get, get them together, and then once we have our question and answer session at each uh, uh, end of this talk, uh, we'll be able to present those questions as, as they are uh, uh, submitted. Uh, so without further ado, um, I will go ahead and introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Andy Mulder. Uh, he's a fellowship trained uh, hip and knee replacement surgeon, uh, focuses on total joint replacement here at St. Cloud Orthopedics. He's been here for seven years, and he's going to talk to us today about medical optimization for total joint replacement.
And now you're on. All right, there I am. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cool, for that introduction. Uh, like, like Mitch said, I'm a, a orthopedic um, joint replacement surgeon, which means that I, I like to see people with hip and knee arthritis. I like to see problematic or painful hips and knees, uh, infections, things like that. Um, I've included my cell phone on the opening screen here. Feel free to write it down, put it in your phone. You can call me almost literally any time, uh, day or night, with an orthopedic issue. If I don't know the answers, which is likely, I can get you to the person that does. So feel free to reach out. Um, I approach this topic with a little bit of trepidation. Um, I'm not an expert at medically optimizing patients for joint replacement surgery. My thought process behind this is not to, to um, uh, uh, intrude on your territory or tell you how to do things. My my goal was more selfish to say, okay, you know, there's things that patients have. I see all these comorbidities. What do I need to know? What's the latest in terms of the orthopedic literature? So I don't want to, I don't want to uh, imply that that uh, as a primary care provider you should or shouldn't be doing any particular thing. Rather, just to sort of give you the perspective of an orthopedic surgeon and give you a few kind of benchmarks to shoot for that may help um, set patient expectations around elective joint replacement surgery. Give me a moment. I'm trying to advance my slide. All right, figuring it out. Thank you. So, you know, really why I'm here today is because, let's face it, joint replacements are kind of a big deal. Um, there's a lot of joint replacements that happen. Joint replacements that go great are very costly. Joint replacements that go poorly are even more so. And we know that uh, you can see by this slide here that uh, joint replacement uh, procedures, just in sheer numbers, are going up almost exponentially with knees, fairly linearly with hips. Ten years from now, we expect that we'll be doing about 1.3 million hip uh, knee replacements and over 600,000 hip replacements. That's just primary. That doesn't count revision ones. In a little bit older study, we can see that these are fairly costly. Even um, uh, joint replacements, like I said, that are that are that go well are costly. In this case, this is the economic burden of infected joint replacement surgery. This is an older study, so it projects to modern day. So you can see between hip and knee replacements, uh, infections cost society about $1.6 billion. And so doing everything we can to minimize that is certainly to our advantage. So I'll touch on why we should medically optimize patients, which is something that, that you can tell me um, um, just as well as I can tell you. Who needs medical optimization? It's not always clear in my mind. And then finally, I think hopefully what is most uh, helpful is what should be optimized and to what extent. That's really sort of what I'm going to focus on mostly. So, you know, we need to medically optimize patients because it just makes sense. There's an abundance of literature uh, in orthopedics. We agree on almost nothing except that comorbid conditions increase poor outcomes, infection and otherwise. Who needs medical optimization? Um, it depends on a lot of things. You know, a young, healthy 20-year-old needs a knee scope, probably doesn't. Um, somebody that's got a history of, you know, cancer, blood clots, COPD, et cetera, probably does. You know, the, is the surgery going to be small and quick? Is it a carpal tunnel under local anesthetic? Is it a general anesthetic for a four-hour back surgery? Those are factors. And also local considerations, that is, what's kind of the community standard? Is it expected that people will have it? And honestly, anesthesiology kind of has the, the gavel at the end of the day. The buck stops with them because if I think they're good enough, if you think they're good enough, and anesthesia doesn't feel comfortable, then surgery is going to get delayed or canceled. So it's not always clear, and there are exceptions to all those rules. And for me, again, part of this, the topic of this talk is selfish because the whole clearance process is a bit of a black box to me. I say, you know, okay, you've got end-stage arthritis. You've tried injections, medications, you lost weight, et cetera. So now go see your provider and get cleared for surgery, and then, then we'll do it. Well, you know, it's generally through you all that this happens, and I wanted to make more sense of that process. Um, my personal preference is to send them to primary care if you feel that 
subspecialty referral for cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology, et cetera, is necessary. I let you handle that. And I think the bottom line is we need help. You know, I'm a good carpenter. I'm a bad cardiologist. I'm a bad a diabetic manager. And that's just the reality of it. I'm, I'm far enough removed from that where I don't feel comfortable. So it, it's really a team effort. And, and what it boils down to, as, as you know, as well as I, there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. There are modifiable risk factors that can be perhaps optimized, things like, you know, renal disease, coronary artery disease, uh, pulmonary issues, atrial fibrillation. You can't necessarily eliminate those as risk factors, but they can be optimized. The things that I'm really going to focus on today are these modifiable risk factors. You know, obesity, we're going to talk about, you know, what is an acceptable BMI. Um, diabetes certainly has an effect. Tobacco use, particularly the nicotine in those products. Nutrition, anemia, opioid use, you know, should we be screening for urinary tract infections? Uh, mental health has shown to be a potential um, arbiter of poor outcomes post-surgery. Things like anemia, we talked about depression, you know, dental issues, vitamin D. We won't cover all these in detail, but there's a, a myriad of modifiable risk factors. I'm going to focus on a few of them. One of them is, is opioids. Um, orthopedists in the past, I think, have been pretty guilty of sort of giving someone a knee replacement and a goodie bag with 100 Percocet. That's not the case anymore. Uh, we're much more judicious. We know that, at least in some studies, uh, knee replacement patients who have uh, preoperative opioids have um, less improvement of their pain postoperatively. None of these studies are true universally, but they certainly speak to some patterns. I think that what was interesting, what was interesting to me is, and my studies will all be at the end of the talk if you want to reference them, all the references anyway, um, that people who have opioid prescriptions for less than three months before a knee replacement are at the same risk of needing them afterwards or post-operative pain as an opioid naive patient. If you've been on opioids for greater than six months after six months preoperatively, that increase your risk of, of um, adverse outcomes, including infection. And, and so it doesn't make sense exactly why that is, but that's the case. Between three and six months, so greater than three, less than six months of pre-surgery opioid prescriptions, you're at higher risk of a 90-day readmission, but not infection. And we found that, by we, I mean people that are smarter than me that do these studies, uh, if people that are chronic opioid users have a three-month opioid holiday pre-surgery, then the risk of post-operative need for and, and pain control issues is about the same as an opioid-naive patient. So I think that that three-month window is, is, is probably, while not critical, is a good sort of rule of thumb. And if you can get people to stop their narcotics for three months before surgery, I think that would be to their great benefit. A word about injections. Um, I do a lot of injections in hips and knees. I know primary care does a lot of injections in hips and knees, and that certainly is appropriate. One thing that I run into fairly often is patients that will come from their primary care. They said, nah, we tried that third shot, they worked in the past, they didn't this time, so I'm ready for my knee replacement. And I go over everything with them and I say, you know, an injection of any kind within three months of surgery puts you at higher risk for infection. And they tend to be frustrated that they have to wait that three months. Um, it doesn't matter if it's corticosteroids, visco supplementation, you know, stem cells, prolotherapy, anytime a needle goes through the skin into a joint, it's three months before the joint replacement. And I suspect it's because, you know, dragging bacteria from the skin into a joint with a needle is the issue, not necessarily what you're putting inside the knee. And uh, younger age, male sex, increases that risk slightly of infection after a shot. But I think a good rule of thumb, again, is three months between an injection and a replacement of that joint. Tobacco, specifically the nicotine component in tobacco, whether that's through a patch, through a lozenge, through gum, through a you know e-cigarette, what have you, the nicotine, as we know, is a, a vasoconstrictor. So the arterioles will constrict, you get less uh, blood flow, less sort of end um, organ tissue perfusion, so you get a little hypoxia, you get decreased collagen production and decreased uh, healing and, and uh, fracture healing in particular. And so when I counsel people about smoking, you know, we know from numerous studies that current smokers have a significantly higher incidence of 
both wound complications and infections. Um, current and former smokers, even having a history of smoking, puts you at higher risk of certain complications overall, though not necessarily infection. And there is a general tw trend toward pack year history and complication rate. So if you have a real high pack year history but are a current non-smoker, you're still at risk. Um, but quitting smoking can decrease most of your complication risks to about the same as a non-smoker or a never smoker. So I think it's always worthwhile to try, out, to try and counsel patients for that. That can be a hard stop sign in some um, orthopedic practices for surgery because it is a modifiable risk factor and patients can be frustrated that they, they either didn't know or didn't have an appreciation for how much of a risk that is. Uh, one way that we sometimes monitor that is with a cotinine level. It's a metabolite in nicotine, and it's, it's kind of like the smoker's A1C in a way because it measures your two to four week tobacco, or rather nicotine exposure, and you can break it down towards, you know, obviously they've been smoking or using nicotine products actively because their uh, level is over 200, or if they live in a house with a smoker but they've quit and their level is low, you know they've had passive exposure but haven't likely been um, using nicotine products themselves. So that can be a way to screen. Oftentimes they'll say, okay, you're gonna quit smoking this date, we'll check you a week before surgery and go from there. I think that any amount of smoking cessation is good. It seems that six weeks is kind of the minimum amount to get some of that benefit of complication risk reduction. And that's what I, I recommend people do. Uh, routine screening for urinary tract infections prior to joint replacements, based on my interpretation of the literature, is not necessary. Um, there may be exceptions for people that have chronic UTIs, you know, are on chronic suppressive antibiotics, et cetera. But uh, even asymptomatic uh, bacteria in the urine doesn't even require treatment prior to joint replacement. If someone has a uh, urinary tract symptoms, I think that would certainly be a good time to screen. And if a culture comes back positive, it's worth treating. In my practice, that doesn't delay surgery as long as they've been on treatment. And asymptomatic, you know, dirty UA uh, doesn't need treatment in my mind pre-op and doesn't confer any increased risk of infection. Um, intermittent catheterization is not a risk factor. Um, skipping ahead, sorry. Uh, intermittent catheterization is not a risk factor for periprosthetic joint infection. Indwelling urinary catheter can be. So I much prefer someone who uh, catheterizes intermittently than has a leg bag, something like that. I may treat them differently in terms of antibiotic regimen. Diabetes. Diabetes is a big one. Uh, much like obesity, it's kind of a, a COVID-like epidemic except it's not going away. Um, again, like smoking, obesity, et cetera, diabetes unequivocally confers a higher risk of postoperative complications. Um, I think the two ways I look at that is, you know, the hemoglobin A1C level and the, the blood sugar or blood glucose levels. Those are two things that we know have an effect. It's a little controversial. There are studies that say if your A1C is over 6.7, you're at risk. If it's under 8, you're fine. I'd say a good rule of thumb is 7.5. Some people, 7.5 would be a dream. They're never going to get there. A lot of people with encouragement can, and, that, and that's where you, the experts, come in. And so when I see patients who have you know, horrible arthritis, they're miserable, they're ready for the joint replacement, and their A1C is 10, it, it's it's uh, they always feel pretty deflated to know that they have to work on getting that A1C down. So I think that's a good way to counsel people is A1C is 7.5. Um, I think that what may be a, a bigger consideration is perioperative blood glucose levels. We know that if your blood glucose level in, in several studies is over 200, that puts you at higher risk of joint infection. And there was one study that said the optimal cutoff of blood sugar levels or blood glucose levels rather postoperatively is about 137. And so I rely heavily on, you know, on primary care, hospitalists, internal medicine to really help tightly regulate that. I always warn people that are on oral antihyperglycemics that they may be on insulin temporarily after surgery because tight blood glucose control around the time of surgery and a good, you know, a reasonable proxy for that is an A1C 7.5 or less. That's how I'm counseling patients based on my interpretation of the literature. So those are some good um, hallmarks to keep in mind. Um, I see patients that are uh, kind of counterintuitively malnourished. A lot of patients with obesity also have malnutrition. 
Uh, you can argue that albumin is a good or not so good proxy for nutritional status. In a lot of the orthopedic literature, that's what it is. An albumin less than 3.5 puts someone at, at risk of, of complications, wound healing issues, et cetera. And so if I have that suspicion, either the little old lady that kind of just eats tea and toast or the morbidly obese patient that may have some of those issues, I don't routinely screen for that. I don't know if I should. I don't know if you should, but certainly that's something to consider. It, as we know, as I discussed, malnutrition confers a higher risk for complications. Uh, they're listed there. All these things can be quite serious, and so keep that in mind. Obesity. Um, so I, I'm willing to bet most people have some patients that struggle with this in their practice. I know I do. And uh, not to dumb it down for you, but rather to refresh my memory, I had to remember that BMI is measured in kilograms per meter squared, and that while it does not directly measure body fat content, it correlates reasonably well to direct measures of body fat. And so, as we know, overweight is 25 to 30, obese is in classes, and what, what the orthopedic literature tends to focus on is, is the so-called morbidly obese patients, that is with a BMI over 40. Uh, here's a common uh, slide presentation about obesity, the CDC map, this one's from 2018. Now, this is self-reported obesity. Minnesota is in that 30 to 35 percent. I don't know what they're doing in Colorado and Hawaii, but I don't know. Maybe it's the legalization of certain products. I, I don't know. Anyway, so obesity is a definite problem here in the Midwest as throughout the country. We know that obesity, you know, controlled for all of the risk factors, has a significant increased risk for just developing arthritis in hips. We know that for knees, if you're obese, you have a six-fold increase in the likelihood of having a knee replacement at a younger age. I always think of knee, uh, obesity as being more of a mechanical effect. The more weight on the joint, the more wear of the cartilage, and certainly there's truth to that. Also, the sort of metabolic, you know, inflammatory syndrome that goes along with obesity alters the local environment of the, the knee fluid and the cartilage. And I, so I think that is maybe more of a bigger effect than the actual extra weight on the joint itself. You know, the so-called metabolic syndrome, as, as you could tell me better, is this, you know, sort of, what is that, five? It's sort of this quartet of, you know, insulin resistance, hypertension, uh, stroke risk, the sort of immunomodulatory effects of the extra adipose tissue and hormonal system. So, that all factors into creating a sort of a, a, a host that is a setup for complications and infection after surgery. Um, a BMI over 40, which is what the orthopedic literature mostly focuses on, includes a risk of dislocation, both superficial, that is like kind of a, a wound issue or deep infection around the joint replacement, uh, DVT, uh, reoperation for any reason, a longer hospital stay, and a higher likelihood of being discharged to a care facility versus home. And, you know, all, all BMIs are not created the same. It's not uncommon to see someone that, that carries a lot of their BMI in their trunk and has uh, fairly, you know, skinny legs without much soft tissue envelope. There's actually been studies that, um, pardon the asterisk, I was going to add graphics to show the soft tissue, and I, I failed to do that. So, but as you can imagine, um, on a knee, if you measure the tissue on the x-ray from the, where you can see the skin to the, um, to the bone, both in the anterior and medial aspect, the, the group that had a, a thicker soft tissue envelope around the knee had a significantly higher infection rate. And these are not all morbidly obese people. This is just all comers. There was also a study that showed that on a hip x-ray, and you can typically see this, you can see the shadow of where the skin starts. You measure from there to the most prominent aspect of the, the trochanter on the hip. And if that envelope is greater than five millimeters and you're going to make an incision on that side of the hip, you've got a, almost a one-fifth higher chance of having a complication rate. So we know that, that BMI as a, as a uh, concrete number is not the whole story. Again, in my experience and what the literature I think bears out is the distribution of the soft tissue. And that's why, for example, you may send me a patient um, and they get a hip replacement and I make the incision on the side of the hip. You may send me another patient, they get the incision on the front of the hip. If someone has a large panis that would hang over an anterior incision 
it's kind of a setup for wound problems, so they may get an incision on the side of their hip. So, you know, I have patients talk all the time about this kind of arthritis, obesity, catch-22. You know, I want to lose weight. My knee hurts. How can I do it? Um, you know, there's there are ways to do it. Um, patients, some do it just by fortitude. Some do it through weight loss programs. Bariatric surgery is, is arguably a cost-effective way to lose weight and make you a safer candidate for surgery. Um, I don't have a lot of patients that are interested in that, and it's a bit controversial within the literature, but I think it's a very reasonable option. I think the other, the other uh, um, rebuttal to that argument is that, you know, to achieve a 5% weight loss post-hip or knee replacement, uh, about 73% of patients after a hip replacement don't do that, and about 60 and 69% of patients after a knee replacement don't do that. So the vast majority of people do not alter their BMI significantly after a joint replacement. So I kind of counsel people that if they can demonstrate weight loss ahead of time, it'll continue. And if they can't, it typically won't. So then the question is, you know, how much weight do I need to lose to become a candidate for surgery? I think a good rule of thumb is BMI of 40. Over that, you should consider it. Under that, you should still consider it, but it's typically less of an issue depending on the distribution of the soft tissue. Um, there was a study that showed that weight loss of 20 pounds, not that that gets you down to a BMI of 40, but a weight loss of 20 pounds versus five or 10 resulted in a significantly lower uh, length of hospital stay, but not necessarily complication rate. Um, and a BMI of 40 is kind of a com common institutional cutoff. So if you, if you go to a large uh, academic center, they may just say hard and, hard and fast rule 40. Um, I think, again, that's somewhat arbitrary, and I think most people in my practice would do it on a case-by-case -case basis. But patients with a BMI over 40 should certainly be prepared for a discussion that their joint replacement may need to wait until their weight comes down a little bit. Well, so now what? So I, I think that overall, the numbers to consider, like we went over, are with opioids. Um, you know, try not to prescribe them if you don't have to. I think um, not giving opioids for non-surgery related arthritis pain is very reasonable. A good rule of thumb is try not to prescribe them for more than three months before surgery. And if you have chronic opioid users, try to get them to quit for at least three months before surgery to give that same benefit of having never had um, opioids in the first place. Another good rule of thumb is that any kind of needle going into a joint, whether that's um, a visco supplementation, steroids, prolotherapy, anything you want to put in there, when a needle goes in a knee or a hip, they wait three months for surgery to diminish that risk of infection. Um, you know, I have a lot of patients that say, you know, I cut my, cut my arm, look, it's already healed up. I'm a great healer. I'm not worried about the complications or side effects. I'm willing to accept that risk. And I think that's a, that is a factor in terms of the patients sort of deciding their own medical care within reason. But what people fail to realize is that, you know, an infected total knee that can't get resolved, you know, you resolve that by an above knee amputation. That's a dramatic life change. And so in my mind, as someone who treats uh, infections that happen in the region, I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to prevent those in the fir first place, even if the patients are frustrated by the, the, the delay in surgery. Um, A1C, a good rule of thumb is 7.5. It's not a magic number. Some people can achieve it, and that's okay, but I think it's a good uh, goal, and if someone's vastly different than that preoperatively, I think it's nice to give them a heads up that I'll be having that discussion with them before joint replacement surgery. We should quit smoking for many reasons. One of the reasons is that, that nicotine has a negative effect on the outcome of uh, joint replacement surgery. As an elective surgery, we really are obliged to stack the deck in our favor. Six-week rule of thumb, try to get them to quit for six weeks. If they're telling you they quit and they smell like smoke, consider a cotinine test. It's a good uh, two- to four-week look back at what their smoking status has been. And then finally, with obesity, that 40 BMI is, is not a hard cutoff, but it's a good rule of thumb for counseling patients as to what they should or shouldn't do uh, in terms of losing weight. Um, a team approach is is uh, critical. I, you know, I can't I can't possibly expect to know how to treat everybody's 
you know, uh, surgical comorbidities, just like I wouldn't expect uh, a primary care provider to replace anyone's hip. So it's a good, um, it's a good, uh, it's a good opportunity to work together. You know, there's abundant um, checklists, sort of risk factor uh, things that are available. This, an, this is an example of one. I don't necessarily recommend one over the other. I think it's important to have your own system. And if it kind of lines up roughly with what I've been talking about, that would be that would be helpful as well. So I think that you know, hopefully this can give you some ballpark numbers. And and if someone really needs their joint replaced, maybe that'll give them the motivation to you know be more compliant with their insulin dosing or blood sugar checks. Maybe that'll inspire them to quit smoking that you've been counseling for counseling them for on on years and years. Maybe it'll prompt a referral to a, a bariatric specialist that they've been putting off because they finally need their knee or hip replacement. So thank you for the work that you do. Please continue. Uh, hopefully this information provides you some, some reasonable, easy to remember guidelines. Um, again, my cell phone number is on the bottom of the screen. I'm always available. And call me anytime, text me. And if I don't know the answers, I'll get you to the person that does. So at this point, we're going to uh, adjust the screen momentarily and we'll get to the question and answer session. Great, thank you, Dr. Mulder, for that uh, uh, for that talk. Uh, certainly, very important in the overall care of our, our patients. Um, so, when, when we're talking about uh, medical optimization uh, for joint replacement patients, is, is there an optimal time uh, for patients to see their uh, primary care provider? Good question. I, it's it's never fun to rush. I know some patients, you want surgery as soon as they can. It's hard to coordinate everything. I'd say generally speaking, if someone has a, a, you know, a chronic a problem like arthritis, when they come to see me and we decide that surgery is in their best interest, um, usually surgery is not happening just from a scheduling standpoint from four, for four to six weeks after that. So I think that if someone is going to be uh, having that discussion with me, I think the appropriate time to start talking about it with primary care, if things are pretty well tuned up already, four to six weeks, if there are some glaring um, you know, issues in terms of things that have just been hard to deal with in the past, I think the sooner the better. So generally speaking, from the time I say, okay, surgery is indicated, you've got about a four to six window to make that, make that uh, visit, make any tweaks that you can. And certainly for a, a challenging diabetic or someone else with those issues, um, more lead time is necessary, and I'll typically give the patients that, that heads up that we're going to have to work on those things ahead of time. Yeah. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, uh, uh, as I, I'm sitting here uh, uh, moderating the, this uh, event, uh, ultimately, you, just to remind you, you can ask questions, and I will be able to see them. Um, and and so, so I just encourage you to continue uh, sending them in. I really appreciate that. Uh, um, one question that came in is that uh, uh, you stated that younger age and male gender has a potential increase for infection. Um, so what is considered a younger age? So the, the particular slide you're mentioning is was regarding just pre-surgery injections in knees and hips. So they found that in addition to having that, that three-month window, if you do a, a joint replacement sooner than three months after an injection, that's a higher risk of infection. And the people within that group that were higher risk was younger age and male. Um, so younger age is about 50 years old. So that was sort of their cutoff. And so younger age means different things, whatever your age is. But I'd say younger in my mind is 50 or less and in that study as well. And 50 or more is in that older age. And the risk for males in younger age was specifically with pre-surgery injections and doing a joint replacement within three months. Thanks for the question. Uh, so when you start talking to a patient about doing a joint replacement, how, how long is it usually between you start seeing a patient and then you decide ultimately to do surgery? Everyone's different. So I can have a patient come to me that's got an x-ray that 
looks like a grenade went off, they've got horrible arthritis, and they said, you know, I've been doing pretty good, but the last two months I just haven't been getting around as well. You know, that's a patient that in all likelihood will need a joint replacement. However, they haven't tried anti-inflammatory medications, they haven't done therapy, they haven't worn a brace, you know, they haven't tried any uh, injections or anything like that. So it's rare that I see someone and schedule them for, for surgery unless they've already gone through the non-operative sort of protocols. Um, and so for me, it varies widely. If someone's got bone-on-bone -bone arthritis in their hip or knee, they've been on ibuprofen to the point where it, it, you know, it causes them GI distress, you know, they've been using a cane, they quit doing their you know, yoga, washing the car, mowing the lawn, they're stuck on the couch, they've done all those things already that I would normally recommend, I may schedule them for a surgery you know, a couple weeks from now at that first visit. For someone who's got milder arthritis, you know, I will generally try to treat them conservatively. There have been some studies that indicate a lack of joint space narrowing uh, correlates to less of a positive result after a hip or knee replacement. So I really try to make sure that radiographically they have the disease and it matches their symptoms. So it could be anywhere from they get booked for surgery that same day or we might know each other for several years before we get to surgery. So, so after, so they get their evaluation with primary care, and ultimately, it, there's some concern from a medical standpoint that the, that they're at higher risk for surgery. So, so what happens, uh, or what should primary care do if they feel that the surgery is canceled or delayed? I think that first of all, you know, a surgery date is, is just that. It's not a, it's not a, it's not written in stone. It's not a law. It's not a requirement. So if there's any reason where you say, okay, you know, pending the blood work, you know, Bob's going to be fine. You get the blood work back and something is, is amiss and you need more evaluation. I think it's, it's always appropriate, you know, with consideration for the clearing uh, provider to cancel the surgery based on any concern they may have. And if that's something that you feel comfortable managing and tweaking and correcting, great. If not, I think referral to the appropriate specialist is, is definitely within your purview. I don't know that I always feel, you know, if I refer everyone with a stent back to their cardiologist before surgery, the cardiologist isn't going to be doing anything else. So I rely heavily on your expertise to know when it's appropriate to refer. And if there's anything in that preoperative workup, even if I've sort of jumped the gun and scheduled surgery, I'm, you know, as inconvenient as it is for the patient and their expectations, I want a safe, appropriate patient. I think it's appropriate to cancel surgery if you need to and refer as you see fit. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, so what is your opinion on prophylactic antibiotic use prior to dental work for people who have uh, a prior joint replacement? Good question, Mitch. I get that question not infrequently. So there is, um, I think there's two ways to approach it. There's, there's a way to approach it from a practical um, sort of protocol standpoint, and in this office, that would be everyone gets prophylactic antibiotics that has joint replacement before the dentist forever, and I think that's, uh, I think that's very reasonable. Um, my interpretation of the orthopedic literature regarding to dental issues and joint infection, along with the joint AAOS, American Association of Orthopedic Surgery and American Dental Association joint statement, the newest one basically says, eh, it says you can do it if you want. You should consider not doing it if you don't think you need to. There's no consensus in my mind. And so if a person has a good reason not to have antibiotics because they're allergic to them, because they get GI distress, because they get a bad rash, I'm totally okay with saying don't worry about it. If a patient feels strongly, I'm happy recommending it. And if you call and ask the office, the office policy here is that everyone gets it forever. And I think that the, the risk of prophylactic antibiotics uh, is very, very small. A joint infection is very, very, very bad. And so whether or not the science backs that up, I think it's a reasonable policy that our office has adapted. And for simplicity's sake, that's how we, for the foreseeable future, that's what we're going to continue to recommend. Case by case, I personally don't have strong feelings about it, but I think from a practical standpoint, I would continue to prescribe it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mulder. I appreciate your time uh, with us here today. Uh, we will uh, uh, switch uh, uh, our, our speakers uh, at this point in time. 
Uh, we will uh, move over to uh, uh, getting our next speaker uh, uh, set up. So uh, appreciate your patience as we uh, go to do that. Um, and we will be with you uh, here uh, shortly. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, we now have uh, uh, Dr. Holine here with us. Uh, Dr. Holine has been with us uh, uh, for 18 years. Uh, he is a, a, a general orthopedic surgeon who also specializes in joint replacements. He's gonna talk to us uh, uh, today about the evaluation and treatment of hip pain. Uh, so we would like to uh, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Holine uh, uh, to this uh, uh, to our, uh, our our presentation here today. Thanks, Mitch. Um, first of all, um, Dr. Holine, as you said, um, I'm going to open this up by this is all a, a different situation for all of us. But as Dr. Kula talked about earlier, please feel free get a hold of him with any questions as we're going. If it's something during the presentation, um, there will be a question and answer time at the end, just like before. But if there's anything that's coming up that you want me to kind of veer off topic a little bit or, or discuss. This is for you guys, so I want to make sure you're getting what you want out of it. So hip pain. I'm guessing some of you, you get those and they come in, and the first thing you think is, great, somebody's coming in with hip pain. First thing is it's painful for the patient and for the provider. Visits can take longer than expected. Symptoms descriptions are usually vague. It hurts. Visits often end in asking for the pain medication and all these things together make them less than desirable visits. If we were practicing 20, 30 years ago, it was, it was a lot easier. Back then, you think of where it was. Most of your pain, pain on the backside of the hip equals sciatica. Lateral pain is bursitis, and anterior pain is arthritis. Pick one. Nowadays, today, post your pain, it can be lumbar stenosis, nerve root impingement, SI dysfunction, piriformis syndrome, pelvic dysfunction, just Issue of tuberosity pain, lateral pain, radicular pain, abductor pain, bursitis, IT band snapping, neuralgia, all kinds of algas, itises, anterior hip pain, arthritis, stress fracture, AVN, FAI. As you can see, oftentimes it leaves everybody frantic. Primary care, us as, as orthopedic surgeons. So try to break it down. And remember with all of this stuff, Whenever you're starting, go back to the basics. Really kind of go back to what we learned in medical school. Um, history, physical exam, imaging, tests, and kind of just break it down. Start at the beginning. In the history, listen to the patient, and more importantly, as they're talking, watch them, read their body language, sometimes the way they sit. We've all seen that classic sign of sitting kind of taking the weight off of their hip that almost guaranteed is going to say there's something to do with the back and the sciatic nerve issue or, or lumbar pain. Where is the pain? Is it on the side? Is it in front? Is it, is it posterior pain? Does the pain shoot down the leg? Um, is it constant pain? When does it happen? Is it an intermittent pain? Um, how does it happen? Is it activity related? Is it always when they're weight bearing? 
Is it something that's there all the time? It can be passive. How often? What's happening with pain? Is it something that's been the same for a long time or is it increasing? Um, and then what type of pain it is. Um, important thing to ask is what have they tried? And not only is it what we can see in our records, the physical therapy, the medications, activity, that kind of stuff. But nowadays, the big thing is find out what have they done cyber treatment wise? Are they, what has Dr. Google prescribed for them? And what have they tried? And when you ask, make sure you're asking about supplements to see what are they trying natural, naturopathic. Some other history issues. Um, previous trauma, even going back sometimes to childhood and to uh, you know, types of sports that they played, the hard thing with arthritis and hip changes and things like that can be that it, it could have started as a simple injury that they stepped in a hole when they were playing in their backyard as a child, walked it off, and it started things down the road. Um, family history, um, just checking for things like dysplasia. Um, do they have connective tissue disorders, rheumatoid, uh, history, those types of things. And then ask about lifestyle, um, alcohol use, uh, drug use, some of those things can add into it. Also remembering living in Minnesota, things like tick bites can end up leading to joint pains, and especially some hip pain. On the exam, um, look at both active and passive exams. Um, I always go through it in a symptomatic manner with when I'm looking at them. I always start with their lumbar spine, kind of see how they're moving, how they're standing, how they're walking. Um, start with um, looking at the way they're sitting, the way they're standing, those positional changes. They want to always stand hunched over. Do they take weight off of one of their legs when they're standing? All those little things. Um, typically, start with them standing and check their back out, have them bend forward, look at the lumbar exam, and um, good way to stand behind them, look at palpating their SI joint, their trochanters, see if they're getting one ear that's that's getting rip roar and tender. Um, then I typically have them kind of walk across the room for me, come back, and then have a seat on the table. Good way when they're sitting is a good time to check their strength exam. Have them lift their knee up off the table, try to have them pull that, flex that hip up against you. Do a distal exam for nerve root impingement, those types of things. Then have them lay down on the table and take them through a good range of motion. Uh, and the key thing on this is doing a passive range of motion and active range of motion. Passively, how far can you bring them up if they're getting pain in their hip? Are they getting pain when you bring them up into a high flex and rotating? Um, is that pain staying in the groin as they do that, or is it on the backside? And all those can lead to different things that we'll talk about. Um, again, whatever works best for you is just remember, have a systematic exam when you're going through it. So my typical exam we kind of talked about here a little bit. Um, start observing, walking. Sometimes you can catch them even on their way in, so you don't have to do that part of it later when they're actually um, performing for it. You can see what they're doing naturally. Um, the lumbar spine, strength exam, mobility. Um, uh, one I didn't talk about is log roll, have it relaxed and, and see if their hip is real irritable with no, no flexion or tension on it versus when you bring it up and around. Um, um, one other thing I always talk about when people come in with, with hip pain is don't forget to check out to see if they have any skin issues if there are lumps, masses, anything like that. Every once in a while, I'll come into the office and I'll actually pick up a hernia that, that they came in thinking was their, that they needed a hip replacement. And the last time I checked, replacing a hip for a hernia probably isn't going to be a good outcome. Um, imaging. Again, kind of I go back to start with the basics. Start with a good x-ray on it. Um, a lot can be seen from the x-ray, not only at the hip, but also even on the, for instance, on this pelvis exam, you do see the lower part of the lumbar spine and the most common areas that people are gonna have issues in their back are gonna be in those lower levels, especially ones that can give people hip pain. So kind of don't forget to take a look at those couple disc levels that you can see on that x-ray. Um, simple x-rays, the basic ones, hip, I always get an AP pelvis and then an 
an AP and a lateral of the hip. So it focuses down on it. The nice thing about having the, the pelvis is, just like on this one, you can see both hips. You can kind of see what their balance is. They look like their pelvis is tilted. Um, and then you can hone down in on, on the AP and the lateral. Lumbar, getting a good PA and lateral spine. Femur, you can look at, do an AP and lateral there. And if people come in and you're not sure if it's a hip or a back, a quick screen is to do a, a, a an AP and a lumbar spine and then do a, just an AP pelvis so you get at least a, a good starting look. And you can always send them back for more x-rays if you need it. Just a couple pictures of some things that you can see on the left is, is a picture that shows some changes that can be related to impingement. It's called a crossover sign. We can talk about that later. Um, on the right is a picture of a subtle change of an AVN. You can see a little bit of the class where the arrows are pointing. CT scan. What, is, what do we use CTs for? In orthopedics, it's good for looking at bony anatomy, looking at fractures, um, if there are lesions, cysts inside the bone. Um, you can see if there's been any um, cortical disruption, especially like in a patient with AVN, for instance, if there's you're going to see if the if the cortex has broken and it's starting to collapse. Um, Occasionally, we'll pick up masses, like I said. Uh, bony erosion masses. Um, the other thing we can look at is the the mechanics of the hip. Um, you can tell us if it's for things like impingement, the way that the cup is angled. The, everybody's different, and sometimes that can actually be the angle that can lead to people having issues. MRI scan. Big thing with MRI scans, I tell where, whatever joint you're looking at, whether it's a hip, a knee, anything like that, is when you're doing it, do it with a purpose. Um, be looking for something specific, because if you look for anything, I can guarantee you're going to find something in there. And the hard part is, once you find something, you're now having to deal with it, even if it's not necessarily what's going on in the patient. Um, sometimes it saves you some, some explaining later on. Um, what, what the MRI scans are good for, of course, is looking at soft tissues. For us specifically, inflammation, tendonitis. Is, um, you can, uh, one of the big things obviously everybody looks at is a labral tear. Um, Big thing with labral tears, I'll kind of talk a little bit about that here, is if you do an MRI scan as we age, a lot of labral tears will occur as part of the degenerative process or the aging process. So if we do an MRI scan on everybody over the age of 50, 40 to 50 of those patients, or 40 to 50% of those patients will have a, a radiographic or an MRI um, labral tear, at least of some tight. If we increase that to 60, that increases to about 70%. So you really got to match it up with the symptoms. So if you, if you see it automatically, it does not automatically mean that's what's causing the patient's pain. Um, MRI scans are also good for looking at stress fractures, so any bony changes. Um, you can look at AVN, avascular necrosis, where an area of the bone dies, uh, and it can look for impingement talk about what a cam lesion, which is what we're looking at on the left, where there's bony overgrowth on the femur. Um, and then a pincer lesion would be if there's overgrowth on the cup side. And then the labral tear. Um, and again, we kind of just talked about that. Um, one thing that I will bring up, if you're really concerned about a labral tear and you're doing an MRI scan, uh, doing a gadolinium arthrogram as part of that will be beneficial. Without it, depending on which radiologist you talk to, you can miss about nine to 10% of them if it's a plain MRI scan. With the dye involved, you pick up about 99% of them. And then we can also look at um, lateral hip pain, people who get bursitis. Most commonly with bursitis, there's also a component of uh, tendonitis of the abductor muscles as well. And we can kind of look at if people have bursal pain, sometimes it can be actually that it's more an abductor pull or um, partial tear, which sometimes we'll treat differently. 
Um, another thing to kind of look at, it can pick up hamstring origin pain um, at the issue of tuberosity. A lot of people, uh, as we age, our hamstrings tighten up and it puts more traction on that backside. And um, about 10% of the time when I see people who come in with hip pain, they've got actually um, essentially inflammation of the origin of the hamstring kind of pulling on that tuberosity. Kind of see a little picture there where it's all white. Labs. We don't use them all that often when I'm first just kind of scanning a patient. Um, but if we're worried about um, kind of there being either uh, infection or um, just generalized inflammation changes, I'll do a simple TBC with differential, a SED rate, and a CRP. And if there's any concern with a family history or multiple joint involvement, um, I'll do a quick um, rheumatologic screen, and I think every clinic kind of has a little bit of a different um, set that they use. Um, one thing we talked about earlier with it around Minnesota, always consider a Lyme, a Lyme screen when you're doing labs too, just to make sure that that's not the subtle issue. Um, diagnosis. Again, use a symptomatic approach, like with any problem. Um, the key thing around the hip is, remember that 50% of all hip and pelvic pain is usually multifactorial. They have a little bit of some arthritis in their joint, they have some lumbar disease, they may have some bursitis. Um, the key is to try to figure out what, which entity is the highest percentage of the issue. Um, and so kind of work in that direction. So the other thing is just remember that common diagnoses are common for a reason. So look for the for the basic ones first. As I put it, when you hear hoof beats, first think of cows and horses around here. If you can't find cows and horses, then go looking for zebra and antelope. Okay. Um, so the common ones: arthritis, stenosis, uh, bursitis are all kind of the common ones to, to look at first. Um, at this point, normally I'd kind of do some cases and kind of ask your opinion on kind of what we're gonna, what we'd be looking at and kind of where we'd go from there. With this, with this format, it was gonna be a little bit tough. So hopefully if we look at different joints, we can do, and we can have this next year, come back and we can kind of do that kind of stuff then. So what I'll do with this one is looking at treatments and then we'll talk about kind of some different entities here. Um, when you're looking at treatment, what is your goal of treatment? As I alluded to with usually things around the hip being multifactorial, remember that some of treatment can actually be helping us eliminate or try to hone down diagnostically on what is actually the issue. Um, um, again, use a systematic approach. I always try to tell myself to go with the, with the KISS principle, and we all know it. KISS stands for and that's just keep it simple. I'll call myself stupid. Um, and then um, really important to make sure that we're communicating with the patient because especially as I alluded to with people doing a lot of work on their own with Dr. Google, sometimes they come in with that expectation of this is what I've got and you're not treating that and you didn't even talk to me about that. But if you ask them, oftentimes you can you know, if it's, it's off base, you can tell them pretty quickly and then they're right back on board with, with trying to figure it out. Medications. Um, just like all of the other things I talked about, medicate with a purpose. Um, often um, with, with treatment with medications, oftentimes they're a little bit longer term use in a lot of uh, more chronic hip pains. Um, Oftentimes, if you can, we start with NSAIDs, inflammation from all the stuff. We'll, usually an NSAID will be good for musculoskeletal pain in general. Uh, again, comes with the side effects and avoiding some of those things in, in patients you know are appropriate for. Um, in my practice, I really try to avoid narcotics as much as possible uh, because, for, again, for long-term pain use, we know it's not the best option for it. Um, there are still defined discrete situations, but remember, 
um, just use them discreetly for short periods of time and again with a reason. Um, so just different ones, NSAID, Tylenol, over-the-counters, that can be very effective for pain control, pain relief with it. Steroids will use sometimes uh, like a Medrol dose pack or a short taper um, to kind of get on top of the inflammation and then see if it um, can help it out. Neuroregulatory medications like gabapentin, um, we'll use that in situations. The big thing that I, I caution everybody is remind a patient that when you put them on gabapentin, this isn't an immediate pain medication. It's not going to be that you take it and, and a day later they're feeling great. I, I see a lot of patients come and say, yeah, they put me on it. I took it for, for three days and it didn't do anything, so I stopped taking it. Um, muscle relaxants and then um, narcotics. Um, one thing that, you know, especially now that we really look at, uh, homeopathic treatments. A lot of patients are coming in having tried things or also um, sometimes we'll recommend giving things a try. Essential oils, aromatherapy, uh, uh, some people are using turmeric uh, naturally, glucosamine, fish oil, um, other modalities like acupuncture, acupressure. Um, again, all of them can have a pace a place, and especially when we're talking about kind of chronic issues, arthritis, those types of things. Um, I'll have patients come in and who will talk to me and say, sheepishly, I, I went and saw a chiropractor or I tried this with it and thinking I'm going to yell at them. And, and first thing I'll ask them is, did it work? And if they say yes, I'll say, okay, keep going, keep doing it. Um, the Again, the other part of this just to remember is you know, a lot of that stuff is just unregulated, especially like the glucosamines and things like that. Um, if you're, what I tell people with things like glucosamine is if you're going to give it a try in general, look at what it's going to cost for a month and never buy the cheapest stuff you can find and never find and never buy the most expensive. Therapy. Um, physical therapy can have a good role in treating hip pain and, and helping us differentiate things. It can help both um, treat the patient, but also can help us figure out what is that biggest percentage? Is it the 50% or is it 80% back and 20% hip joint or is it 80-20 the other way around? Sometimes that's hard to pick up when you're just seeing them in clinic. Um, they can pick it up because they're seeing them more often. They can dive in a little bit more. Um, one thing with therapy that I encourage is if you get somebody into a therapy program, kind of reevaluate it in a few weeks on what the progress of that PT is, and don't be afraid to adjust it as they're going. And more importantly, when they come back and, and they say it didn't help, really dive into asking, well, what did they do? What things did you try? And in your mind, you may have not gotten what you thought they're going to get at therapy. Um, injections. Um, we use ejection, injections a lot around uh, trying to figure out what's happening in the hip and differentially injecting different areas to try to help figure out which of those areas is, is causing the issue uh, more so. You can inject in the spine, the SI joint, uh, the greater trope cancer, um, the hip joint itself, uh, psoas tendon, and ischial tuberosity. Those are all areas, and, and we'll sometimes work through that to kind of help differentiate what's happening. Um, when I do an injection or have an injection done for patients, I do put the patients on task a little bit, which is to really have them think about whenever we do the injection and the numbing medicine, the local anesthetic goes in, what do they feel like after that a few hours or a day or two? Is the pain better? And if there is pain, it's better. What pain is better? Is it butt pain? Is it thigh pain? Is it groin pain? Is it neck pain? And if they get pain that's better, the big thing I have them do is write down how much better is. Is it 10%, is it 20%, or is it 80%? So you will check them back in a few weeks and see how they're doing to see if the steroids kicked in and helped out. But if they're hurting the way they were beforehand, and I ask them, well, for those three hours after you had the injection, is it, it was it better and what was better? They're not going to remember. I mean, I can't remember what I had for breakfast three days ago. So if you ask me six weeks from now if something earlier helped, I'm not going to remember that either. Um, 
and as from before, I'm, I'm approaching Dr. Mulder's older age group, so not young age group. Uh, other ones, steroids. Um, so different types of injections. Steroid injections can get good, good initial injection. It's inexpensive, can help us diagnostically. Hyaluronic acid injections around the hip. The jury's still out on how much that, that helps in the hip. It's much more effective in knees than it is in hips, but it can be done. And then there's the whole other topic of regenerative medicine, which is PRP and stem cell injections. We use those sometimes. Um, again, that it's certainly available. We talk to patients about that here, but it's that's kind of a topic for a whole other talk. Surgery. I'm a surgeon. I like to do surgery, but um, again, it could be a whole topic on its own. Uh, different surgeries, depending on what they need. Our lumbar surgery for the back stuff with it. Arthroscopic surgeries, um, reconstructive surgeries. The big thing with surgery, the only thing we can guarantee is that it will be different. The big thing is trying to figure out with your help and, and through us is, is different going to be better? Um, I just threw a whirlwind at you. Um, again, the hip could be a three hour topic just to talk about. Um, so a quick run through a, a quick thing, just hip arthritis, classic presentation, uh, groin pain, pain when they walk, relieved when they sit down. Best test for that is just doing a simple x-ray on it. Treatments, anti-inflammatories, injections, all the way up to surgery. Really symptomatic. The whole goal of treatment of that is to keep your good days because they can be and keep your bad days to a minimum. Um, and whatever we need to do to kind of keep it that way. Um, femoral tabular impingement. That means basically things are pinching together. Um, that is one in a younger patient can be uh, very much benefited from things like arthroscopic surgery. Um, young patients in that, Unfortunately, at 40 and younger, you start to get over 40, it, it starts to be less and less effective. Um, same thing with labral tears, which is this. Um, presentation classically, pain in the groin when they're going to deep squat, deep flexing. Um, sometimes they'll hear a pop or a catch. Um, testing in that, we talked about MRI scan uh, with the uh, gadolinium. Treatments, a lot of times we'll start with treatment simply on that, which is to actually try an interarticular injection on that patient to see if it actually relieves their symptoms. And even most arthroscopic um, hip surgeons will require that as a trial before they'll consider doing surgery on it. So it's something to consider if you're worried about a labral tear, having them do an injection before coming in. Um, AVN stress fracture presents usually if there's been a collapse as a, a sharp pain with stress fractures, it's any weight bearing is going to cause problems oftentimes in flexing. Um, testing, sometimes you can pick it up on the x-ray. A lot of times both of those are MRI scan based. Um, treatments will really vary on that. And I'm kind of running through this a little bit fast, so please feel free to ask if there's questions on any specific ones. Um, flexor still has tendonitis. Big thing to think about when people come in with groin pain, everybody automatically, if they see a little bit of change on an x-ray, want to think that it's actually arthritis. If they're having pain when they're specifically trying to lift that up, and especially when you load their, their leg, trying to keep, keep some pressure on their thigh, and they want to jump through the ceiling, a lot of times that can be a psoas tendonitis, so something to think about. Um, testing on that um, doesn't get picked up real well in imaging. A lot of times that's just more physical exam. Treatment, I started with trial of physical therapy on that, and then potentially injections. Um, bursitis, abductor pain. Lateral hip pain, worse when they're standing on it. Um, one of the best tests for it is to try to have them stand on their, on that same leg um, and lift the other leg up and stay balanced. If they start to drop over, that could be that there's some abductor tearing on top of a bursitis. IT band syndrome can be a lot of times in runners, um, feel a hip snap or a pop up around their hip, up around the, the trochanter. Um, testing, again, more physical exam. Treatment, a lot of times that's originally starting with physical therapy and then injections if it's, if it's warranted. SI dysfunction, more posterior pain, pain when they sit, pressure over the backside, occasionally getting pain radiating out along the gluteal muscles. Um, testing, um, best one is put them on their back and do a, a figure of four test, 
really stress that by bringing the leg up and externally rotating. If they feel pain on the back side, not up in their groin, that could be SI dysfunction rather than hip uh, arthritis. Spinal stenosis, uh, classic presentation is getting pain on both sides. Um, worse when they walk for a period of time, standing for any period of time. Um, and um, if they get relief when they use the shopping cart, the shopping cart sign is a good one, especially as the patients are obese, they understand that one. Um, testing will be picked up most often on an MRI scan of the back. Um, treatments, you can try injections, and ultimately uh, therapy, sometimes traction can help, and eventually surgery. Um, in summary, this was a quick whirlwind overview of hips and hip pain. Big thing that I want you to take away from this is whenever they come in, listen to them, do a systematic history and physical, and then kind of hone down on, on something to say that maybe this is a major thing and start there, but just understanding that the area of the hip is a great mimicker. People come in with one pain that sounds like it's coming from the back or from the hip, and it can be um, the opposite. But start with those common things. Remember, you know, around here, hoof beats, think of horses and cows, look for zebras and antelope second. Thank you. And kind of whirling through it and yeah. questions. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Holine, for being with us today. Appreciate that. Uh, the excellent overview of the evaluation and treatment for hip pain. Uh, so if a patient comes in uh, and they have not been evaluated for hip pain, um, at what point in time would you get an x-ray or should everyone have an x-ray? Um, if they're coming in for the first time, they come in and they say they have hip pain, I would go in and talk to them first and kind of make sure, number one, are we actually talking about the hip itself or is this lumbar related? Oftentimes I'll start out with an x-ray on that visit if there's any question and it's just deciding which one to get. So in general, x-ray is a great place to start. And which, which views would you order if you are gonna order an x-ray? So for the hip, um, I do again, as I talked about earlier, an AP pelvis, so you can look at both hips, and then an AP and a lateral view of the hip, um, that single hip. Just gives you a good overview to look at it closer. Yep. And, 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 and just by the way, for everyone, everyone listening uh, uh, for this live uh, uh, presentation, uh, certainly don't don't forget to uh, direct your questions. Uh, go ahead and type them in uh, through the GoToWebinar, and, and we'll certainly uh, get those answered as they as they come through. So appreciate the questions that you've asked already. Uh, and so if you're going to do uh, further uh, studies, which uh, it, when would you think about doing an MRI uh, for this patient that came in on the first time? I certainly, the only time I would look at it, an MRI scan on the first visit is actually if they come in and, and I'm really worried actually about the back and that this may be a disc herniation causing ridiculous pain. Um, that's probably where I would start with an MRI scan. A lot of it, like you said, I'd start with the x-ray, see that patient. If you're worried about a, for instance, a labral pair or FAI, a lot of those patients will actually have see the physical therapist first or try some anti-inflammatories first, then bring them back. As I alluded to earlier with it, if you do an MRI scan on everybody, you're gonna find stuff. And a lot of times you spend a lot of time chasing things that may or may not relate to what's going on with the patient. And part of it is because the patient knows it's there now. They've seen their reports, they, you've had to tell them about it, and they're going like, well, what about this? Well, it's, really doesn't have anything to do with what we're, what your pain's from, but you gotta, gotta go down that road. Gotcha. At what point in time uh, would a referral be appropriate? I think a couple times that it's, it's appropriate. Number one, the biggest one is whenever you're getting outside of your comfort zone of what you feel that you can take care of. You know, if it's early on, if you're saying like, eh, stuff you talked about, I don't even wanna deal with that. Send them over, happy to see them to kind of start that work up. Um, big things, if you're comfortable trying stuff with it, and if you're getting to the point where you're saying, okay, simple things, the simple therapies, the medications, those types of things aren't working for us anymore, or, and we need to take some 
more aggressive steps, that's a good time. Second one is if you kind of you try some of the simple stuff, you're going like, ah, this is still confusing. I don't know what's going on with this. So send them over. Good time to do it. In, in that uh, history uh, or the exam part, is there one or two red flags uh, that people should be looking for that would make them concerned they need to see a surgeon sooner rather than later? I think in the in the history. Um, if if somebody's had a, a, a rapid onset of of pain, um, especially like in the groin, for instance, and um, no real history to bring that on, you look at an X-ray and and you're kind of worried that something looks a little bit funny in the hip joint with it. I think that's a good time to do it because that's where we're worrying about something like AVN or potentially a uh, joint infection, those types of things. So if it's an acute onset that you can't readily explain, I think that's a good time to. Yeah. Well, great. Well, we are out of time, but I wanted to thank you, Dr. Holleen, again for, for joining us here today uh, and, and for your review of the evaluation and treat, uh, treatment of hip pain. Uh, we will uh, take a small break here. Uh, we need to switch our uh, uh, computers for our next presenter. Uh, so uh, just give us a, a small moment and we will be uh, right with you. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have Dr. Mariosh now here with us. Dr. Mariosh is a podiatrist in our group. He's been with us for 22 years. Uh, he is a, a, a expert in uh, uh, care for uh, uh, foot and ankle, uh, as well as does uh, joint replacements of the uh, uh, of the ankle. So what we're we're having him talk to us today is about the differential uh, diagnosis of the uh, acute ankle. So we'll turn this over here to uh, Dr. Mariosh. Thanks, Mitch. Good yeah. evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about the acute ankle, or maybe a more appropriate title would be the differential diagnosis of, of the acute ankle. Um, probably the most common ankle injury we all see in the office or even in emergency settings is going to be the ankle sprain. And that's about 85% of all ankle injuries are sprains. And that accounts for about 10% of all visits to the emergency room. And it's about 28,000 people per day that sprain their ankle in the United States. And 75% of these ankle sprains are going to involve the lateral ligament complex, the anterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneal fibula. And um, about 20% of these people are going to go on to have ankle instability and chronic lateral instability. And I would say most of this is going to be due to um, either the patient's not seeking treatment for their sprain or perhaps even under treatment. But if you do the math on this, that's about 4,200 people per day that sprain their ankle. They're going to go on to having uh, unstable ankles. So that's quite a, quite a big number of people. So again, we have to uh, make sure we don't under-treat these, uh, these common ankle sprains. 
So what I want to talk about today is the objectives of this talk as it develops is to review the examination of the acute ankle because certainly uh, it's not just a sprain or a fracture that we're going to see of the ankle itself. There are other uh, things we need to make sure we don't miss around the ankle joint. And uh, like I just said, we're going to discuss the commonly missed pathology with acute, acute ankle injuries. We'll look at imaging, whether we get uh, plain film radiographs, whether we need MRI studies or CT studies. And we'll talk about treatment options and when it's best to refer this ankle injury uh, to an uh, orthopedic specialist and when and what we're going to do for rehab of the ankle. So let's talk, start out by looking at how we system, systemically look at the ankle and um, go around the horn here of the ankle joint and talk about how we uh, examine the ankle. So the first thing you're going to do is perform a gross observation. Note any soft tissue swelling or ecchymosis. You can see the swelling there laterally with the ecchymosis extending from the lower leg down to the area just below the lateral malleolus. And you want to look, again, you can see the left side here, anterior laterally, you see a lot of swelling compared to the contralateral side. It's, it's really good to... Uh, to compare to the contralateral side to, to make sure um, show where the swelling is or the discoloration. And then um, looking at the skin, also to make sure there's no openings in the skin, which we'll talk about here, but have the patient point to the area of maximum tenderness. A lot of times they're not going to be able to do this. They're just going to point around the whole medial and lateral aspect of the ankle or part of the foot or the leg. But a lot of times patients are able to pinpoint exactly where most of the pain is coming from. And again, uh, let's make sure there's not a break in the skin. You can see the ecchymosis here. Obviously, this is something that's not going to show up in your office. This is going to be in the emergency room, but obviously an open fracture is something that's going to go on to uh, needing emergent surgical treatment. But subtly, you can have these abrasions, and you can see the tenting of the skin and the blanching of the skin around the medial malleolus, which is uh, indicative of being almost a, uh, an open-type fracture. You can have small openings in the skin um, with underlying fractures, or in this case, you can see the, the ankle is deformed and it's in a varus position, and you can see the blanching of the skin, so we're real close to being a, an open fracture, but in this case, this is going to require some uh, emergent treatment to get this reduced. So number two, you want to palpate the base and the shaft of the fifth metatarsal, oftentimes with inversion injuries of the ankle and the foot. Um, in addition to having an ankle sprain, you may um, have an injury to the base of the fifth metatarsal. So when we look at fifth metatarsal fractures, you can see that there's many different areas that we have fractures, but primarily uh, with lateral ankle injuries, we're concerned about the tuberosity fracture or avulsion fracture, which is zone one, and the Jones type fracture, zone two. With these zone one avulsion fractures, um, perineus brevis inserts at this area as well as the lateral band of the plantar fascia. So that can avulse a small piece of bone there. In this case, you can see it's a non-displaced fracture. Um, again, something like this can certainly be treated conservatively in a walking cast or cast boot uh, without needing surgical intervention. And then you can have these situations where this fracture uh, being intraarticular involving the base of the fifth metatarsal and cuboid is displaced. This happens rarely, but this would be a surgical indication to anatomically reduce this and place a screw across uh, this type of fracture. And then we have the Jones fractures. There's a lot of times a lot of confusion between the basic avulsion fracture at the base of the fifth metatarsal and the Jones fracture. Jones fracture, the zone two fracture, is more proximal and it, it gets its. Uh, name or it's, it's being famous for the fact that these fractures don't heal very quickly and it's postulated that look at the blood supply here on this diagram to, to this area there's a nutrient artery that enters the uh, medial aspect of the shaft of the fifth metatarsal and uh, that's disrupted so we have this so-called watershed area of blood supply which may lead to delayed healing so uh, this was a nice study done um, about seven years ago just showing uh, where the blood supply of the fifth metatarsal is, and, and you can see there on the left screen that nice little diagram showing the nutrient artery entering the, the shaft of the metatarsal, and it's about 26 to 27 millimeters proximal to the base. So again, that's right in the area where these Jones fractures are, 
And that's why uh, we're so concerned about these in terms of uh, doing proper treatment and getting these things to heal. And sometimes we'll see delayed healing. Normally it takes fractures six to eight weeks to heal. Here's an example of a Jones fracture. Uh, they don't always have to be treated surgically, but oftentimes in young athletes or young active people, um, we'll want to treat these surgically to get the patient uh, healed faster if possible. This is an example of a patient that uh, um, was middle-aged and wasn't necessarily a great surgical candidate. They weren't very active, so they were willing to try to get this to heal uh, conservatively. So I, I won't put these people necessarily in a weight-bearing cast. I'll keep them non-weight-bearing uh, for several weeks until we start seeing some signs of healing. And you can see here on the x-ray where it did go on to uh, satisfactory healing. But again, oftentimes in younger athletes, uh, even without displacement of this fracture, we'll go ahead and, and fix this with, uh, with a large screw going across the area there. And, and again, just to kind of summarize these fifth metatarsal fractures, this base fracture that's non-displaced, this is something that probably doesn't require a referral to us. You can certainly uh, keep the patient non uh, or weight bearing or partial weight bearing in some type of cam boot. Um, and again, you just have to be patient, taking x-rays every uh, four weeks or so, and, and usually by that six to eight week point, you'll start to see some uh, consolidation of the fracture. If you have a displaced fracture, this certainly would warrant a referral uh, because this is going to require uh, more than likely surgical intervention. And I would say it's, it's probably a good idea to um, refer all Jones fractures as well because even if you treat these conservatively and, and not treat them surgically, they're going to take quite a long time to heal and, and it's going to kind of get you nervous as you start following these x-rays because you may not see bone healing going on for several weeks on your x-rays. The third thing is if the patient's a child, you want to palpate the medial and lateral malali over, over the distal tibia and fibular vices to uh, evaluate for any possible um, uh, Salter Harris type fracture. You can see this is a Salter Harris type fracture one where you have distraction of the distal fibular physis and it can be rather subtle. You, on that x ray view, there's just a small gapping laterally, but the patient has pinpoint tenderness to that area, more pain there than they do over the lateral ankle ligament. So I would go ahead and treat this as a uh, non displaced Salter Harris one fracture and just keep it immobilized uh, for two to three weeks. And then you can have the Salter Harris two fracture where you have that little spike. Uh, back up into the metaphyseal area. And again, these can be non-displaced as well. You can see you have to look kind of hard to see that uh, Salter Harris II fracture on the x-ray, but it's there. And, and again, it's not displaced, so it can be treated conservatively. The ones we have to worry about are these Salter Harris III and IV fractures, the distal tibia. They can be displaced or non-displaced. And usually we're looking uh, for about two millimeters of offset in the joint or displacement of the fracture fragments, and oftentimes we'll need to get a CT scan to, to evaluate these. But that Salter Harris 3 on the left, and then this is a Salter Harris 4, these are the ones that can most commonly go on to growth plate arrest. So whether you treat these surgically or conservatively if they're not displaced, uh, these are the type of patients we need to follow um, probably at least once a year until their growth plates are closed to make sure they don't uh, have a rest of the, of the distal tibiophysis. And then again, um, for looking in an adolescent child, we have, we have uh, the growth plate of the distal tibia starts to close at the midline and progresses medially, and that lateral aspect of the growth plate is still open. So these are patients that are 13, 14, 15 years old. Uh, the growth plate's not entirely closed, so you can get these transitional type fractures. And this is the juvenile Talot fracture, and you can see on that CT scan the displacement. And again, we're looking at anything greater than two millimeters displacement or offset is something where we'll want to uh, address this surgically. And as I flip this uh, 3D CT around, you can see the anterior uh, syndesmotic ligament there is with the rotational injury evolves that fragment. And then I'll rotate this around. You can see how that fragment is uh, intraarticular in, in nature and how it goes through the uh, the, the distal tibia. And again, if these are displaced, this is something that would warrant a referral. So I think any type of juvenile um, growth plate type fracture is, is worthwhile to refer over, and then we would get a CT scan to further evaluate this. Then we have these pediatric triplane fractures. This is just one step away, a little bit more rotation and increased injury, where you not only have that fragment that you would have with the uh, Talot fracture, but you also have a posterior fragment. And these can be two-part, three-part, or four-part fractures. And these are a little bit more involved. But again, 
The growth plate is not entirely closed. It's partially closed medially at the distal tibia. So again, it's uh, often good to, to get CT scans to further evaluate these and see if they need any uh, further treatment. The fifth thing is palpating the distal third of the fibula, looking for fracture of the fibula itself. And we have basically have three different types of fibular fractures. A type A is a, is a avulsion type fracture. It could be a small avulsion or a large avulsion that can be displaced or non-displaced. You have the type B fracture a little more high up, starting at the level of the ankle joint, progressing proximally. Then the type C fracture is above the level of the syndesmosis. And if we look at different radiographs here, you can see that's a, a larger type A fragment, but it's non-displaced. This is something that certainly can be treated uh, conservatively without surgery. Type B fractures, they can be treated conservatively. It depends if there's a displacement or not. So I would think these are certainly fractures that can be uh, referred over if we have any question about whether they need surgery or not. And the type C fractures are the more unstable fractures. They usually involve uh, separation of the syndesmosis and the widening of the medial clear space or even a medial malalar fracture to go with these. And, and these often always need uh, surgical intervention. And then this brings us to palpating the proximal fibula just uh, above or below the knee area. Oftentimes with these uh, severe rotational ankle injuries, you can get a proximal fibular fracture called a mesonew fracture. And you can see that on the x-ray there. And that uh, often is correlated with widening of the medial clear space and widening of the syndesmosis, but not always. You, you can certainly have a normal looking ankle mortis but still end up with a, uh, a proximal fibular fracture. And what happens with these rotational injuries, the, the the, the force starts medially, and you either rupture the deltoid ligament or you have a medial malalar fracture, and then this force goes through the uh, interior and posterior syndesmotic ligaments through the interosseous membrane, then that force exits out the proximal fibula causing that fracture. So oftentimes with these proximal fractures, or most of the time, you're going to have some instability of, of the ankle mortis itself. And then palpating the medial malalus. Um, we can see that uh, with any type of uh, rotational injury or uh, eversion type injury, you can have a fracture. These can be vertical or horizontal. Uh, this is just a standard uh, medial malalar fracture. Oftentimes, these uh, are in conjunction with fibular fracture, or, which would be a bimalalar fracture, or you could have that small piece or large piece posteriorly, which ends up being a trimalalar fracture. So when you see these, these are certainly uh, fractures that you want to refer over to um, orthopedics for uh, possible surgical intervention. And then finally, uh, or almost finally, the dorsomedial aspect of the foot, looking for uh, Lisfranc fracture dislocations, which normally happens with a plantar flexion injury. These are more common uh, now. We see them with football players, but they can happen with motor vehicle accidents and motorcycle accidents. And originally, these were described as horse riding type accidents. We have disruption of the, the Lisfranc ligament between the base of the second metatarsal and medial cuneiform. And you can see on these standard x-rays, um, the right um, x-ray is normal. On the left, you see the offset of the um, medial cortex of the second metatarsal not well aligned with that medial aspect of the middle cuneiform. So that's rather indicative of a Lisfranc fracture. And these can be rather subtle. In this case, you can see a few millimeters of displacement. In this case, um, we have uh, quite a bit going on here, not only with the second metatarsal, but also the first and the third. So these uh, are certainly situations that would require surgical intervention. Even these subtle type fractures, if left neglected, um, can go on uh, to developing post-traumatic arthrosis in the midfoot, which can be rather debilitating. So this certainly is uh, something you want to uh, refer over. Oftentimes, you won't see this little subtle displacement on a non-weight-bearing radiograph. So we kind of urge uh, patients uh, to do a weight-bearing radiograph if they can. Oftentimes, they can. We can do stress, stress views to try to see if there's any uh, displacement here. And then here's just a small avulsion fracture off the dorsum of the talus. This can happen at the navicular as well, but there's usually a, a ligament that can pull off between the talus, talus and the navicular, and you pick that up on the lateral view. And then the dorsolateral aspect of the foot, uh, in this case, we're looking at the anterior process of the uh, calcaneus. My pointer here on the computer, if I can point to that area right there, there's a bifurcate ligament um, that can get a false that uh, small portion of the anterior process of the calcaneus. This is often missed uh, in the emergency room when ankle x-rays are done. The, these fractures can be quite subtle. They can be large or small, sometimes displaced, and you can see that on the medial oblique view as well. Um, 
and uh, also we want to look at the Achilles tendon. We're looking mostly three to four centimeters proximal to the insertion. This is where tendons rupture the most, but you can palpate the whole posterior aspect of the heel. Sometimes you can have a avulsion fracture where the Achilles tendon pulls a piece of the heel bone off. But I just want to demonstrate this is a patient who's going to have surgery on their left side uh, for an Achilles tendon rupture. When it's this obvious, you don't need to order an MRI. You can see the right foot has a normal plantar flexion tone compared to the left foot, which is just kind of dangling there. And we're going to demonstrate what's called the Thompson's test, where you squeeze the calf and the, the right foot, which is not involved, you'll get plantar flexion of the uh, ankle. And then on the left side, when you squeeze the calf, uh, you're not going to see any movement. And you'll be able to palpate the deficit there, too. So when you have something that's this obvious, this is just a clinical diagnosis. And most of the time, you're going to do surgery on this. You, you don't need to order an MRI before sending the patient over. And uh, palpating the area posterior and superior to the lateral malleolus for tenderness along the perineal tendons. I would say this is something to look at. Um, sometimes you can have an acute um, rupture of the retinaculum causing subluxation of the tendons, but this is probably more of a finding you're going to see in a patient that had a history of a bad ankle sprain or a series of ankle sprains, and they're having chronic pain now after the normal healing process has gone by, and you're going to um, maybe have some pain to the tendon. In some occasions, the tendon can be split longitudinally, which we pick those up on MRI uh, on most occasions. And then here's a little video showing an example of subluxation of that tendon as the patient rotates their ankle. Uh, the tendon is going to click over the, uh, the lateral malleolus. They'll feel the clicking. You'll see it. You may even hear it. And, and certainly, if you put your finger or thumb there, you'll, you'll feel it and be able to push it back in as well. Video's lagging behind here a little bit, so I'm going to kind of wait for that to catch up. Should be okay there now. Okay, and then um, palpating the area posterior and inferior to the medial malleolus for tenderness along the tibialis posterior tendon. Um, it's rare, I think, that you're going to see a rupture of the tibialis posterior tendon from an acute injury, but they do happen. Most of the time, you're going to see these uh, as chronic ruptures where the tendon deteriorates over time usually at a sedentary, obese patient that's middle-aged, but you certainly can have acute injuries to this area, so you want to make sure you palpate along the course there. And, and again, you may have tenderness from the medial malleolus if there's a fracture or tenderness of the deltoid ligament, which, which is in this area as well, just deep to the tibialis posterior tendon, but you want to make sure you don't miss uh, an acute tear. With um, tibialis posterior tendon that's insufficient, you'll see a unilateral flat foot. Sometimes these patients have bilateral flat feet, but you'll see more ankle, you'll see more heel valgus on the affected side, and they won't be able to do a single heel raise on that side as well. So that's one tip or a couple tips to uh, help you figure out if there's some posterior tibial tendon pathology. So just to review the exam here, starting from the left on the top, you see uh, over the proximal fibula, checking for tenderness there for a maze new fracture, and then on the dorsum of the foot, um, checking for tenderness where it would be indicative of a Lisfranc joint, and then moving over to the Achilles tendon, looking for ruptures. Um, the top right screen there, we're looking at the medial malleolus, deltoid ligament area, and along the tibialis posterior tendon, and then on the bottom right, you'll see the uh, from left to right, the base of the fifth metatarsal, and then over the dorsal lateral aspect of the foot, um, indicative of a possible anterior process fracture of the calcaneus, and then over the lateral ankle ligaments and lateral distal fibula, and then along the perineal tendons. So based on your history and exam, we'll determine whether diagnostic studies are warranted. And uh, you've probably all heard of the auto ankle rules. I'm just going to kind of really buzz through this really quickly. If you have pain to the lateral or medial malleolus or inability to bear weight, that would necessitate getting x-rays. Um, as far as the foot goes, tenderness at the base of the fifth metatarsal or navicular or inability to bear weight would um, want you to get x-rays. Uh, clinical judgment should prevail over the rules if the patient's intoxicated or uncooperative, has other distracting injuries, diminished sensation in legs as in a diabetic patient with neuropathy or gross swelling, which prevents palpation to these areas, you'll want to get x-rays anyway. So some of the tips here, you want to palpate the entire distal six centimeters of the fibula and tibia. Uh, don't neglect the importance of the medial malleolar tenderness. Um, you could have some deltoid ligament involvement as well. Uh, be cautious in patients that are um, 
under age 18, again, being careful of um, uh, growth plate type fractures. And then uh, lastly, looking for lateral talus process fractures on x-rays. This is another uh, fracture that's very difficult to see sometimes uh, and missed in the ER. This is the classic snowboarder's uh, injury. Uh, you can see on that 3D view that the lateral process of the talus fractured, and, and you can see that uh, below on the x-ray as well. Sometimes you can just have a little fleck uh, of an avulsion on the left screen, and then you can have some comminution, and then you can have these large fragments. And this is a CT scan. This is a rather large fragment intraarticular into the subtalar joint, so this is something that can be surgically uh, repaired with a screw um, since it is an intraarticular fracture and rather uh, distracted. Um, osteochondral injuries, um, sometimes you're going to see these uh, with an ankle injury. If you do see it on x-ray, that means there's underlying bone involvement because you're not going to see cartilage alone on x-ray. Uh, do you get an MRI with these? I think most of the time you're going to see this down the road in somebody who's had a series of ankle sprains, but I'm just throwing this up here for sake of completeness. This was a study that was uh, reviewed or presented uh, over 10 years ago. Um, at an orthopedic foot and ankle meeting. They looked at 133 patients that had lateral ankle instability. They all had some type of lateral ankle reconstruction over this five-year period, and all of them had ankle arthroscopy, uh, diagnostic arthroscopy, and MRI study uh, before their definitive surgery to fix the lateral ankle instability. And in fact, it's found that the MRI actually missed 61% of the chondral injuries, 40% of these brevis tears, and 43% loose body. So the take home point here is if you have a high index for suspicion, the MRI doesn't always uh, give you the answer. If there's a high index of suspicion, refer the patient over, we can do some intraarticular diagnostic injections and some other uh, studies to try to see if there is something else going on in the joint that maybe the MRI is not picking up. So if the findings are incompatible with a fracture or significant soft tissue injury, um, then we're going to go ahead and uh, treat this as an uncomplicated ankle sprain, and um, this is again the isolated ATFL or anterior talofibular ligament is usually involved. Uh, sometimes calcaneal fibular ligament, calcaneal fibular ligament as well. Uh, we want to immobilize uh, the ankle. Uh, usually, if, if in, in grade two or three sprains is more severe, I'll put them in a splint and keep them non-weight bearing, and then uh, elevation and ice and rest and then get them into a boot after one week and start some guarded weight bearing. But I like immobilization for about three weeks before we start therapy um, just to get those ligaments to get scarred down and heal so they don't heal in a stretched out position and leave you with uh, chronic instability. I'm not a big fan of these uh, type of ankle uh, braces. They, they seem to put more pressure on the areas that hurt and uh, patients really, really don't like them that well. I like these uh, lace-up ankle braces that we can use uh, as part of the rehab process as the patient starts to get more active. And for rehabilitation, very briefly, we can do home exercises where you have the patient do uh, active dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, writing the ABCs with the ankle and tell them prevent, pretend you have a, uh, a pen sticking out of your big toe and you're gonna rotate the ankle, write all the letters of the alphabet in space. And um, Certainly doing non-impact exercises like biking and swimming are fine. And then we can get into formal physical therapy if necessary. And um, we're about out of time here, so I'm not going to show this too much. But this is a Biodex machine where the patient really, it's a lot of concentration on developing increase in proprioception and um, increasing strength. So uh, this computer screen is just kind of telling you which way to move, and it kind of shows you where you're moving to, so it, it helps with the strength and proprioception. And then um, there's other techniques of doing this as well, various exercises. You can do these single leg squats on these BAPS balls or boards and um, really, you know, not only getting the ankle stronger, but working with proprioception. So this is a, uh, this is something that you would do at the end stage of your rehab. And if you can do this, you can certainly uh, return back to activity at this point. So that's, uh, that's a good maneuver. And then just other exercises you can do in physical therapy um, for strength and proprioception. So to summarize here, uh, we looked at the examination of the acute ankle. Uh, we looked at other pathology associated with these acute ankle injuries. Uh, we looked at various imaging studies when x-rays are appropriate and sometimes when you're going to do more advanced imaging. Um, I guess my personal preference is if, if you think more advanced imaging is needed, 
uh, that probably warrants a referral, and I would just refer the patient and, and have us decide what type of imaging we're going to do, whether it's MRI or CT study, or if we need to use any type of uh, contrast in, uh, arth uh, in the joint to, to further evaluate any pathology, an arthrogram um, with MRI. And then treatment options we looked at and rehabilitation and when to refer. Um, again, most lateral ankle sprains do not require a referral. However, if you see any of these things, fracture, dislocation, tendon rupture, tendon dislocation or subluxation, uh, neurovascular injury, joint locking, disproportionate pain, or atypical presentation, these are certainly uh, times to refer over to orthopedics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mariosh, for, for joining us here uh, for your uh, evaluation of the acute ankle. Um, again, thank you to the uh, audience for submitting questions as uh, uh, we go through our uh, uh, presentations. Um, we'll do a, uh, a question and answer session uh, uh, with Dr. Mariosh here uh, for the next uh, uh, five minutes. Um, so as you, yeah, so at, as you're evaluating an ankle, uh, is, is there a time uh, where you would get uh, uh, x-rays uh, immediately if it was more chronic in nature? I would say if, if there's a chronic injury or if they've had a series of ankle sprains and the patient feels they have instability or instability and pain, I would repeat um, plain film weight-bearing radiographs. And certainly in doing um, an anterior drawer or an inversion test clinically, um, you can get stress radiographs where we actually stress the ankle under x-ray to see if there's instability and I didn't show any of those. It's more kind of advanced imaging stuff, but um, I think somebody who has chronic ankle pain with instability, that not only buys you uh, plain film weight-bearing radiographs, but stress films and possibly an MRI as well to rule out any, um, any pathology that you might not be able to see on x-ray, such as tears to the perineal tendon, the splits, or any uh, osteochondral injuries to the uh, Taylor Dome. And so, so one question here is: is if if a, if a primary care is evaluating uh, a patient with an acute ankle, is there what part of the decision making process do you decide whether to use a splint or some type of cam walker or other type of immobilization? Is there something that that factors into what your decision yeah, process that's is? Yeah, great question. Certainly, in mild sprains or grade one sprains, where the patient has minimal swelling and minimal pain, but they're just concerned because they had an injury. Um, and you could probably get by with some type of ankle brace. But as you get into the grade two and grade three injuries where you have more swelling, more pain, more ecchymosis, um, I would be more apt to use some type of splint. And whether you start with the splint or the cam boot, um, I think for me it's, it's kind of that judgment call is how much pain the patient has and how much swelling they have. Because a cam boot is not going to do a very good job of, of getting rid of the edema. And, you know, with a splint, you can get the patient non-weight bearing. You can explain to them, this is a splint that's not designed to put weight on. I need you to elevate this. I need you to ice it. I need you to stay off of it. And then if you're good, within the next week when you come back, you'll probably notice the splint start to loosen up, which means the swelling's going down. And then their pain probably is doing better at that point, and I'd be more apt to get them into a cam boot. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, if uh, primary care is going to refer, is there a a recommended time is it one of those things where you know they should get them uh have them come over to us right away through our ortho direct is it one of those things where they could come in the next day or later this week is there something that makes you concerned about the evaluation or, or an x-ray finding that patients should be seen sooner rather than later yeah i think any um, fracture that's displaced i would try to get them in sooner or later certainly it, it, what would be emergent, I would say, if you if somebody came into your office and, and actually had tenting of skin or an open wound uh, or, or deformity associated with the ankle compared to the contralateral side, that, that needs immediate attention. Um, as far as um, an, an ankle sprain, you take plain film radiographs and, and you don't 
see a fracture and you're comfortable that it is a sprain, but it may be a bad sprain, if you have the ability to put on a splint, go ahead and do it. We'll see them back in a week. If you don't, we'll see them emergently that same day and, and put a splint on. Um, and, and, and in children, if, if there's pediatric type injuries, if you're concerned about that there may be a Salter Harris a fracture, um, we'll, I would say let's, let's see that patient immediately. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you, uh, kind of speaking of that, so what would be your usual treatment for a Salter 1 fracture of the distal fibula? Non-displaced? Non-displaced. Um, I would say I would put the patient in a weight-bearing cast if there's not much edema. Uh, certainly, if there's a lot of edema, I put them into a splint, but I think um, putting them into a weight-bearing cast, um, they in, in change take that cast off in a couple weeks usually the tenderness is markedly decreased at that point, and then we can start using some type of uh, cam boot if necessary, or even an ankle brace, and then gradually rehab from there. For, for an acute ankle uh, with a lot of swelling and, and ecchymosis, is there a right way to ice and elevate, or is there any specific recommendations? Yeah, I think um, when icing, I, I like to tell the patient to elevate the extremity and, and bend the knee. Because if they're, they're elevating their, their foot and ankle and their knee is straight, that puts a lot of stress on the back of the leg, a lot of stress on the knee. And bending the knee helps. And I always try to tell them, think of toes above your nose. You, you may not be able to get your toes above your nose all the time, but if that's your goal, that's, that's a good point. Of, of You have it high enough. And as far as icing goes, um, make sure you protect your skin with some type of cloth, not putting ice directly on the skin. Um, I would keep the ice away from the toes. It's very easy to give yourself uh, frostbite if you ice too long on the toes. I think maybe icing for 15 to 20 minutes and uh, doing that two or three times a day is sufficient along with the elevation. Very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Mariash. I appreciate your time uh, uh, with us today talking about the acute ankle. Uh, we will now go ahead and take about a, a 10 minute break. Uh, so uh, get up and stretch, uh, and then we're going to make some changes here, and we will be back with you here uh, uh, shortly.
That's good. All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Let me get my phone. Hello, everyone. All right. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. So we had a small technical difficulty. Please forgive us. Uh, we are ready to start for our uh, uh, next talk. Uh, we would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ashley Bottrell uh, with us. Uh, she is a uh, PM&R uh, physician who specializes in the uh, non-operative treatment uh, of spine injuries. Um, she is going to talk to us today about back pain in the uh, adolescent athlete. So we'd like to welcome, welcome Dr. Bottrell. Hey, um, so I do non-operative spine care here at St. Cloud Ortho. And so one of my focuses is uh, back pain in the adolescent athlete. And that's not an uncommon thing that we come up with, actually, especially now um, as kids are more and more involved in year-round sports. Um, and the intensity has is, is increased so much as well as the duration that it's becoming more of a, a prevalent thing. Um, that it's important to really catch early uh, so that we can get kids treated for this. So um, I'm talking about back pain in the adolescent athlete and the importance of catching a PARS fracture. Uh, so the PARS, as many of you may remember from a long time ago uh, on x-rays, is the, the Scotty dog collar. Um, and that's kind of where the, the fracture occurs and it looks a little bit like a, a, a collar on the Scotty dog, as you can see from the white arrow on the left side. And that's the area that we're really focused on um, for PARS fractures, uh, which is one of the more common causes of adolescent athletes' lumbar pain. So just as an overview, um, in general, there are more than 4 million visits to the emergency room for back pain. And it has an incidence in adolescents of 50%. And granted, that doesn't mean chronic back pain. That's just I have back pain um, incidence, um, not... not uh, relative to duration, intensity, uh, or location. Uh, but that's definitely a large proportion of, of our teenagers and, and young people that, that have had back pain in the past. Of those visits, uh, most of them don't really specify, particularly in the emergency room. The goal is, is pretty much, you know, make sure you're not going to die of it and get you out the door to somebody who can treat you correctly. Um, of those, though, they did find that 7% were spondylolysis, which is the, the fancy term for um, PARS defects. That's barely above tumors, which I don't think of as being uh, necessarily very common. Um, and just under kind of the wastebasket diagnosis for uh, adolescent back pain that includes all the other more common things that we think about in adults of discs, joints, uh, and things like that. When we think about adolescent, adolescent athletes, athletes, excuse me, obviously the, the big things that we think of are, um, you know, football, volleyball, gymnastics, those kinds of things as far as impact goes. But the other really important thing is extension. Um, diving is actually somewhat of a contact sport. You're in contact with the water. You're forcing your lumbar spine into extension. Uh, gymnastics is obviously very extension-based. 
dancers uh, oftentimes. Um, they're not listed up here, but are certainly a common cause of, of back pain, uh, particularly associated with extension. Wrestling, rowing, baseball, figure skating, uh, volleyball, lots of impact with that. Um, and things that you don't think about, tennis, uh, soccer. Uh, do you see a fair amount of baseball, football, and, and crickets in parentheses just because there were some English studies that really focused on cricket as an aspect of it as well. Uh, the incidence of spondylolysis is estimated to be anywhere between 30 to 40 percent in adolescent athletes. Um, that's a pretty large proportion of just about anything, um, and kind of keep that in mind as we go through the slides later because we'll talk about other, other um, relative incidence rates. So the anatomy, the pars interarticularis is basically the bridge between the joints. It's, it connects kind of the, the front of the spine and the back of the spine and holds everything together. Um, it's a very thin uh, band of bone. It's mostly cortical and it's uh, kind of the connection point between the joints above and below. That being said, if you think about a small area between two larger areas of bone, it is going to be an area that has a lot of focal pressure on it. Um, that, that makes it a lot more susceptible to any kind of injury or stress. When we talk about spondylolysis, we're talking about unilateral or bilateral fractures of the, of the pars. Um, one side, two sides, uh, often one time, one side can become two sides if it's not uh, caught and identified and, and stopped. Um, it can go anywhere from an acute reaction to a chronic non-healing fracture or a gap fracture as opposed to just a stress reaction. Uh, so the, the term spondylolysis covers a wide range of diagnoses. And again, back to kind of that Scotty dog picture. Um, the, the normal without the dog collar and the spondylolysis is that dog collar and that one actually looks like he probably has a little bit of spondylolisthesis as well because it's a little bit elongated there. Uh, and just another picture of it, sometimes I find it helps to think in 3D, so just trying to show you all the possible ways that it could look. Um, another picture of spondylolysis there kind of along the, the back of the spine. And again, the x-ray view that, that we may be more familiar with, uh, kind of the, the break there where you see the, the gap between the bones. That's a definitely more advanced uh, spondylolysis. And again, just another picture of the anatomy from the back end, giving you an idea of where that, that pars defect lies. Uh, and again, CT view, just uh, to kind of give you an idea that it's uh, kind of on one side of the transverse process near the joint, and that's where that large white arrow is. Kind of looks a little bit like this every time I see it on end on end. Think about it, little stormtrooper action there. Uh, and just an idea of what the various structures in the spine do as far as the, the front side, back side, vertebral body, the arch, uh, and the posterior elements. If you see the red ring there, that's really the focus that's the protection aspect uh, of the cord and the inside things. Um, and if we lose that ring of protection, uh, we put everything inside that at increased risk. Uh, and when we have parse fractures that develop into kind of non-healing uh, gap fractures with final thesis, that, that ring is compromised. And so we're compromising essentially, or potentially compromising everything inside. How does it happen and where do, where do we get it from? Uh, they did a study and um, found that it was not present at birth uh, in, in babies, essentially. The onset of it occurs anywhere between age 5 and age 12. It's been kind of the youngest documented onset. Uh, they believe that it's related to the stress of walking and, and being upright. Uh, they did a study on adults who had never actually been upright on two feet and found that none of them had pars defects on x-rays. Quite a coincidence, possibly, but also um, you know, indicating that, that that stress there is a big factor as far as the development of spondylitis. Other associated factors. Um, been some associated factor with uh, spina bifida occulta. Um, what happens there is that kind of with the, the poor development of the posterior elements, uh, the poor, poor development of the set joints, there becomes a lot more pressure on the pars. Uh, family history, for whatever reason, genetics, whether re related to bone structure uh, or um, just general anatomy in the spine, there does seem to be a, a family genetic component associated with it. And then again, back to the extension-based sports, putting that, that pressure there, kind of at the, the posterior elements and the lowest lumbar levels in particular. 
incidence. So the general estimate is 3 to 6 percent in the overall population. If you remember back to the slide we talked about earlier with a 30 to 40 percent incidence in adolescent athletes, that's a big difference. Um, so definitely adolescent athletes are really the ones that can develop, uh, develop and be uh, symptomatic with spinal crisis. Um, anecdotally, they did a study of first graders, found that at age six, about 4% of them had spinal lysis. At age 12, it went up by about a percent, and then adults back up by another percent. And that was irrelevant of athletic activity uh, or any other sort of components related to spinal lysis. The most common level is the L5-S1 level, and that is where we do have the most kind of pressure in the spine. Um, 80 to 95 percent of fractures are generally found there. Uh, the L4 level is significantly reduced at 5 to 15 percent, and then I have seen it up at, at L2. It has been demonstrated in the cervical spine, uh, but definitely most common at the L5 S1 level. Incidence in athletes. Uh, if you think about one in 10 uh, female gymnasts having a spondylolysis, that's a pretty large proportion. Um, in general, Overall, adolescent athletes about 15%, and then elite Spanish athlete, athletes, just because they did a study on it, about 8%. So in general, one in 10 is, is a pretty significant amount of, of uh, risking spondylolysis and, and further uh, degenerative changes over time as far as our athletes go. Uh, as far as the cause of the back pain in adolescents, about just under 50% has been attributed to spondylolysis, whereas that's only about 5% in the adult population. So again, just kind of showing you the the difference in mechanics and the, the difference in development of spinal lysis. Why do we need to catch it? And I've kind of made a little bit of light of that previously, uh, discussing the risk of de degeneration and changes in the, in the lumbar spine and keeping our, our uh, spine um, integrated to protect us down the road. And the risk with, with spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis um, is that if we do have a bilateral spondylolysis and end up having terminal defects, it does increase our risk of spondylolisthesis. Um, if we have bilateral spondylolysis, it also increases the risks of non-union. If you think about taking a hula hoop and breaking it in half, it's a lot harder to get back together if your two ends are flopping around. Um, again, the risk of spondylolisthesis increases, and over time, the risk of disc degeneration increases. Uh, there's not really a specific study documenting that, but over time it has been documented that spondylolisthesis is associated with disc degeneration. Um, spondylolysis with spondylolisthesis. Uh, again, talking about the progression of spondylolysis, uh, if we allow it to go to, to terminal. Um, about one in four adolescent athletes will already have spondylolisthesis when they're diagnosed with spondylolysis. Um, Hard to know what we attribute that to, whether it's a delay in diagnosis, whether it's so like athletes not wanting to complain and wanting to participate in sport, hard to know for sure. Um, but that is a pretty high percentage uh, if we think about the potential um, problems down the road with spondylolisthesis. It's most commonly seen with bilateral spondylolysis. Again, kind of that, that front back breakage is going to allow that slip uh, and it can progress over time. Um, as it progresses and if we develop progression of the spondylolisthesis, there's an increased risk of instability requiring surgery and, and kind of long-term invasive maintenance. Uh, and that's probably grade three, four spondylolisthesis. Grades do go all the way up to five with spondylolisthesis being if it were off the front. Uh, and that is a pretty freaky thing to see on x-ray and actually see that people are moving around and walking around and don't have nerve compromise in some cases. Uh, and again, a picture of the spondylolisthesis, kind of the elongated, elongated neck of the Scotty dog. Progression. A bunch of different studies show a bunch of different outcomes. Um, basically, those numbers are there to look at if you're interested. But overall, it does show that spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis can progress over time um, up to 20%. Most values are lower than that, but the highest value I found was up to 20% of them progress. Um, not really an indication of how far they can progress, but just putting spondylolisthesis into the mix uh, with teenagers does put them at risk of progression over time and associated changes with that as far as disc degeneration goes. Other things that put kids at risk for progression, one is a growth spread. Obviously, when you're growing and developing your kind of um, modeling bone, may not be as strong in those areas. Uh, I also kind of describe it as having an imbalance where your 
your torque arm and your muscle strength haven't quite caught up to each other yet. So your center of gravity changes, uh, your muscles are still not adjusted yet to supporting your, your weight and your stature. And so there's a lot more uh, pressure at the bottom of the lumbar spine. Uh, also, if your initial slip is greater than 20% uh, or about borderline grade two spondylolisthesis, you do have increased risk of progression. Interestingly, there is no association with pain as far as progressing spondylolisthesis, and there's no association with increased progression with continuing athletics. What's behind it? It's basically a fatigue fracture, kind of the shin splints of the spine. Um, stress, overuse, too much running for shin splints, too much general sports activity and low back pressure um, for the adolescent athlete in the spine. They actually did a cadaveric study where they tried to simulate the pressures on the L5-S1 facet joint. Um, basically just did a bunch of flexion and extension and found that over time, um, basically two thirds of them fractured. Other things that we associate with are less fracturing with age as the bone matures, which we talked about a minute ago. Um, and also there's a genetic component, less fracturing if you have a greater cortical bone cross-sectional area, which makes sense if it's wider and sturdier, it's less likely to uh, succumb to a stress reaction. The biggest key here is how do, how do they present? How do, we, how do we catch this before it gets to be a problem? So obviously it takes some low back pain uh, for the most part to have uh, spondylysis or to, to be diagnosed with a, with a problem. Um, there's lots of studies that have attempted to say, okay, well, if you do this test, then you have it, or if you can bend forward and it doesn't hurt, then you don't have it. Really, there's been no identified uh, clinical exam feature that's going to uh, correctly identify spondylysis. Um, they've done uh, studies on what's called the stork test, which is basically a one-legged extension test, uh, which for a while was believed to be kind of the, the, the focal point of that. Even that's kind of give or take with things. Um, for me, it's a matter of saying, okay, you have back pain, where is it? Are you able to touch it? Are you able to use one finger to touch it, two fingers, or is it more just kind of your whole hand across your back? I find that if it's more focal, I get much more concerned if I can touch it and the, and the, and the patient can touch it as well. Uh, it can radiate. You can have some radiation kind of down the buttock or the proximal leg. It's generally not going to go past the knee. Then I would be definitely more concerned with a nerve problem or a radicular problem. Uh, and actually, I've seen kids who have acute onset of it, who have been having back pain for time, and it's more of a, a long-term occurrence. Um, and you can also have back pain from another cause and then suddenly have uh, uh, it's on a lysis or a partial fracture on top of that. Um, so the length of time that they've had it is not always the factor that you're paying most attention to. Definitely it's important to consider, uh, but it's, it's not the make or break for an active partial fracture. Things are important. You release out every day in all your patients. Systemic symptoms, infectious symptoms, neurologic symptoms, things that would make you think about other causes of back pain. And again, the physical exam, back to what we look for. Low back pain, hyperlordotic posture, meaning they just have that accentuated curve in the low back. Uh, tight hamstrings, spondylolisthesis is generally associated with tight hamstrings, and I do find that to be the case with most of the kids that I see. Um, talk about the stork test, give or take. May give you an idea to look for one, but it's not gonna be the diagnostic tool that, that eliminates the need for anything else. And a normal neurologic exam, again, eliminating other possible causes of back pain. Picture the stork test. How do we figure it out? Uh, is it just back pain or is it a parse fracture? So we get down to the imaging. And generally, if I have a patient come in that I'm concerned that they have a spine fracture, they're in to see me for a reason uh, because it's bothering them enough to be treated. And I will usually x ray most everybody who comes in the door. Um, that being said, Teenagers are still growing and developing. I will just get an AP and a lateral view, uh, and I'll explain more on that later. Um, my goal is less radiation for my patients when possible. So we're looking for specificity versus sensitivity. Um, plain radiographs, plain x-rays. Uh, again, back to the Scotty dog collar uh, and the gap there. The oblique view really only picks up about 19% of fractures. So for me, it's not really a diagnostic tool. I generally use kind of my evaluation of the patient as an indication for me to take the next step or not. Even if you do see one on oblique view, it's not going to tell you the acuity of it. 
The bone spec scan is sensitive, but it's not specific. Um, so it gives you a little bit more um, diagnostic determination over the, the plain film. So they did a study where they did about 50 patients with negative uh, plain film, and they did a spec scan, and about half of them were positive. So even if your x-ray doesn't show a through and through fracture, you can still have a stress reaction that's picked up on the bone spec. CT scan. CTs um, show bone and bony detail fairly well, much more sensitively than plain films do. So CT is going to show you um, maybe not a, an early stress reaction, but it's going to show you the thin lines of an early fracture. The stages kind of go from early to terminal, being the early being just a, a stress reaction, followed by a fissure, followed by a gap, followed by a terminal gap with sclerosis, uh, indicating that there's not a healing process going on. Uh, but again, a CT is just a, a moment in time that's not demonstrated if it's active uh, or if it's a, a chronic change. Uh, and that's just a picture of bilateral. Uh, again, you can kind of see that, that stormtrooper look there with the gaps between the front and the back. Uh, we did talk about the stages ranging from just the stress reaction to the terminal. Uh, and then on to MRI. MRI is usually my, my kind of first diagnosis of choice beyond the x-ray. Uh, it's going to show me other things going on. Uh, it's not going to show me the fracture line well, but it's going to show me that there's edema, that I can suspect that there's a, a fracture underneath that. Um, that edema does resolve with healing, and there is a delay there, so it will continue to be positive, uh, potentially even after the fracture is healed. So therefore, it can miss stage lesions. Uh, but in my mind, the goal is the diagnosis so we can get people treated. Uh, it also does not involve radiation, which is something I try to limit in my adolescent population. And then where do we go from there? So if we have a negative or positive x-ray, we have a, an MRI that demonstrates edema in the PARS, what are we going to do with them? There's always been a question of do you brace them, do you not brace them, can they do their sport, or can they do any activity? Um, and certainly athletes are always interested in getting back to sport as quickly as possible and trying to do as much activity as possible so that they don't lose their, their uh, sport-specific shape. Um, and then kind of figuring out where we go both short-term and long-term as far as pain management, getting back to sport, and ultimately down the road where that's going to take us. So they've done studies, uh, studies that have shown kind of the benefit of bracing in, in many cases. Um, They've shown that over time, most patients do get better with fracture healing and clinical symptomatic improvement over time. The time ranges from anywhere to from three months to, I think, 27 months, I saw. But I, I think they were going for 95% improvement at that point and just, and just taking it out until they got 95% better. Um, what the picture looks like and what it feels like don't always line up. So certainly patients can show clinical improvement um, even with continued changes. Uh, interesting study that they did about unilateral uh, PARS fractures versus bilateral. Um, they did a study with about 30 patients, uh, had a positive spec scan and CT. Uh, they were braced for about 16 weeks in a TLSO brace. Uh, of those, they had 11 one-sided fractures, which all healed. They had about nine uh, bilateral fractures, only about which five of them healed. So it is just demonstrating that it's harder for bilateral fractures to heal just because of the, the um, pressure and mobility on each side uh, than it is with a unilateral lesion. Another important thing to note, though, is that 90% return to their same level of sport. So in most cases, we're able to get kids back to doing whatever they were doing before just as well. And actually, sometimes I tell them well, they may even be better because they'll be stronger for it. They'll have done a lot more core strengthening and have a lot more stability by the time they get back to sport. Uh, and again, just another study demonstrating unilateral versus bilateral healing. Uh, just more data for the data driven out there. So overall outcomes, things that we're that are important. We want to catch things early stage. We want to catch them while they're unilateral. Uh, my goal is to get them in a brace as quickly as possible. For that, I use a rigid uh, custom molded thermoplastic TLSO. Uh, which we'll show a picture of in a minute, but it basically comes from sternum all the way down to sacrum. 
Um, ballpark time, about three months. I generally start therapy in the brace when they are asymptomatic. Um, and once they're asymptomatic in the brace in therapy, then we can start to lean them out of the brace and start getting back into um, building back towards more sport-specific exercises, uh, more cutting, more jumping, more impact, more contact. Uh, and of those, there's a greater than 80% success rate. Take home messages here. So spondylysis is a PARS defect. It's a fatigue fracture. It's the, the, the shin splints or um, stress fractures of the spine. It's staged according to the imaging. Uh, can be one-sided versus both sides. And that if you do catch it at the one side before it gets bilaterally or correlated with earlier healing and better uh, overall healing, better outcomes, you're at less risk of the spondylolisthesis. We do have a risk of progression of spondylolisthesis over time, and so the goal is to avoid that as, if at all possible. Again, with spondylolisthesis, while the risk of progression may be low, we do risk accelerated degenerative changes in the disc due to the mobility, uh, more difficult to heal if we catch the fracture at the spondylolisthesis stage. We want to make sure that we're looking at everything else that we could be causing the pain and eliminating the more malignant causes. Uh, as far as treatment goes, stopping sports and activity is key. Uh, I always tell folks that it's kind of like putting a cast on your arm. We're trying to immobilize things as best we can. It's really hard in the spine because every level has three different joints. And we don't want to body cast you for several months because you wouldn't like that very much. So the goal with the brace is to stabilize as best we can, to remind you not to do the things that you want to do, um, and to try to let things heal as quickly as possible. Getting started in therapy when they're pain-free in the brace. Oh, and back to the brace. I usually say 23 hours a day. You can take it off to shower, and that's about it. So sleeping in the brace, school in the brace, uh, no sports or other uh, exercise activity. Uh, that includes roughhousing with siblings, that includes walks with parents, that includes pretty much anything that's going to be an impact on the spine. Overall, we have, do have really great outcomes with that. Greater than 80% of, of adolescents get back to their sport. Uh, as far as the brace goes, uh, it looks like something that your grandmother would wear as a corset. Um, not the most comfortable thing in the world, but usually well tolerated. Uh, most athletes want to get back to sport as quickly as possible, so they're willing to give it a whirl. Um, they're usually faster at getting it on and off uh, than I can help them with when they're in the office. Long-term goals, uh, how do we avoid it? Do things in moderation, mix it up. It's a stress It's a stress fracture, it's an overuse fracture, it's a repetitive use injury. Uh, and everything that we're doing now is so focused on year-round sports, it's really important to get in cross-training to make sure that for every action there's a reaction, that you're not just working one muscle group or one point in time or one activity. You know, if you're the pitcher, you still can't be pitching all the time. Uh, you've got to mix it up so that you've got symmetric core strength and really stabilize your, your whole 360. Uh, other thing is awareness, listening to your body, saying, I have I kind of felt this before. Uh, we don't want this coming back, being aware of the aches and pains. Um, and keeping up with core stability. So even beyond the therapy that's getting you back to return to sport, we know you've had this problem in the past. Um, we know you've had back pain in the past, and, and that can slightly increase your risk, at least anecdotally, of that long term. So really important to maintain your core strength, kind of lifelong, especially for folks who want to go into college sports, athletics, uh, and those of us who are older wishing we'd stuck with it earlier uh, when we were younger. As the growth phase passes, the risk is significantly less for developing spondylolysis. We've lost that that overturning bone with growth, we've lost that kind of uh, out of proportion uh, height and weightness um, as far as dealing with mechanical stress or so the risk decreases. It's not fully eliminated, but it's significantly reduced uh, down to the order of, I would say, 1% to 2% overall after that growth phase. Uh, and that's kind of sums it up for me. If there are any questions, happy to answer. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Dr. Bottrell, for joining us today to talk about the uh, uh, the uh, PARS fractures. Uh, we do have some questions here that are coming in, so thank you to the audience for sending those in. Appreciate that. Uh, so is there a certain age group that you're typically going to see these type of fractures in, and does that difference be, is there a difference between male and female patients? Um, so yes and no. I would say the typical age group is going to be that growing teenager. Um, <clears throat> girls tend to grow spurt sooner than boys. So I do see girls generally at a younger age than boys. Um, 
the youngest I've seen is probably in a 10 year old, anywhere up to an 18 year old. Um, some of the studies document the early 20s. Um, male female ratio kind of depends. Depends on what season it is. <laughs> I've certainly seen a, a fair number of gymnastics, uh, gymnastics girls and dancers. Um, however, right now it's kind of that, that football season, so there's definitely more football players in the mix. Um, I think overall it, it probably evens out, at least in my experience. Uh, can you help to clarify the incidence of spondylolysis in athletes? There was a stat said 47% uh, uh, occurred in athletes. Is there a specific group that that applies to? Just more in the extension-based sports that were studied. Very good. When a, when a patient comes in for evaluation of back pain, uh, at what point in time do you decide to get x-rays and what x-rays do you order? So generally with um, adolescents, I'm trying to avoid radiation as much as possible. So I'll generally just get an AP lateral weight bearing film. Um, as we said earlier, the oblique views don't really add too much to my clinical evaluation. So I will get x-rays on most patients that walk in the door. And is there a point in time where, where you would think additional imaging? Is there something from a symptom standpoint? Is this something where you see the patient the first time that you're ordering additional imaging? Or is there, there are you doing other treatments in between, you know, kind of to see what their symptoms are or how they're going to progress or develop? So uh, if they point to their whole low back and, and can't focalize, uh, or should you be more focal, inventing words, um, if they can't be focal about their location of pain, I'll be less likely to proceed with an MRI. Um, in many, in most cases, if they have focal pain, I will go ahead and get an MRI to evaluate for a pars fracture. Um, certainly, other things that would add to that would be athletes, um, regardless of the sport, whether it's, it's extension-based or not. Um, and the duration uh, generally doesn't, if, if the feeling that there's focal pain is there and that it could be a pars fracture, the duration of it is uh, not as critical to me. It can be, you know, two days or it can be three months. Um, if, if everything else lines up, I don't think there's a, a too soon uh, time to get an MRI. Uh, when we were discussing the exam, there was mentioned uh, that there are no neurological deficits. So what neurological deficits would you be evaluating here that would make you concerned in a patient in this particular instance or would make you think of something other than this? Um, so generally the the, bottle, the parse, fract, parse reaction, parse fracture is not going to give you weakness. It's not going to give you numbness or pain past the knee in general. It can refer pain kind of more vaguely, non-specifically. Uh, but if a patient had weakness or numbness going past the knee, pain going past the knee, then I would be much more concerned that maybe there was a herniated disc and a nerve problem or something like that. And and if these patients are, are coming to see primary care and, and uh, the question is, is whether or not there's something more severe, is there something specific, uh, that some red flag that says a referral should be done sooner rather than later? I think if there's any discomfort that you have in treating the patient, then there's ne never a wrong time to refer. Um, I'm happy to see folks immediately or see them you know, after their MRI or, or whatever your comfort level is. Um, I think as far as from a primary care standpoint, uh, it's just being aware that, that this exists and that it is something that can set folks up for problems down the road, even beyond their athletic career. So it's something that it's important to catch early. Well, thank you, Dr. Bottrell. I appreciate you joining us here today to talk about uh, spondylolysis and the adolescent athlete. Uh, we much appreciate it. Uh, we'll take a, a small break here and we'll switch our uh, uh, to our new presenter. So please hold with us for a moment.
All right, thank you everyone, we're, we're back. Uh, we do now have uh, Dr. Paul Myrick here with us. Uh, he is a internal medicine uh, residency trained with the Sports Medicine Fellowship. Uh, he, he has been with us over the uh, last year and he focuses specifically on uh, uh, non-operative management of uh, uh, sports uh, injuries. Uh, and so he is here today to talk to us about uh, pediatric athlete overuse injuries in the pandemic. So I turn it over to uh, Dr. Merrick, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cool. Uh, get screen pulled up here. Um, so again, uh, thanks, Dr. Cool. My name is Paul Merrick. This is my first year here, um, so I'm happy to present to you. Um, I just wanted to thank briefly Dr. Gregory. I did my uh, fellowship at Vanderbilt, and he was kind of the pediatric sports guy there, and he helped me uh, set these uh, some of these slides up and, and taught me a lot about pediatric uh, athlete injuries. I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose, and I wanted to just uh, tell you briefly about myself. I'm from Northeast Iowa originally. I went to Luther College um, for undergraduate and then the University of Iowa for medical school. Um, went to UC San Diego for internal medicine residency, and then off to Nashville and Vanderbilt for a two-year primary care uh, sports medicine fellowship. And I've been with St. Cloud Ortho here um, just over a year. Um, and then uh, about what I do, treat children and adults, athletes and non-athletes, um, both acute and chronic injuries and uh, chronic conditions like arthritis as well, and do a bunch of different types of injections, um, steroid injections, visco supplementation, and then some blood injections too. And um, so I don't do surgery, but I'm office-based and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of the team here. So I want everyone to think back to February, 2020, uh, it was a, a happy time. Sports were thriving in Minnesota. Um, men's and women's basketball were doing well, and uh, Minnesota Wrestling was going to host the Division I National Wrestling Tournament at the U.S. Bank Stadium. So the, the Viking Stadium was going to have eight uh, D1 wrestling mats and host the national championships. We were all very excited about it, um, and, and things were good. And then all of a sudden, uh, March 12th, um, uh, the dominoes started to fall on the pandemic here. And so uh, that's when the NCAA called off the uh, Big Ten basketball tournament and uh, they literally walked off the courts and there was an abrupt stoppage. And um, it seemed like the, all the other sports uh, followed through. On March 6th, uh, Minnesota declared the stay-at-home order. Uh, 26th, uh, they uh, declared the stay-at-home order. And then April, May, and June elapsed. And um, we were really without sports. And so children went from, and, and athletes went from being really active to uh, really having a pretty abrupt cessation of their training. And then all of a sudden on June 19th, um, uh, and, and things were turning around, which is great, but we sort of reopened everything pretty quickly. And so after three months of deconditioning and a, a pretty sedentary lifestyle, certainly there was a mix of that, but um, we all thought it was okay to go back now. And so immediately uh, kids went back to the rinks in the fields. And uh, this is a perfect setup for something called the acute on chronic workload ratio increase. Um, and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that, but that's one of the things that uh, puts children at risk for developing these overuse injuries. Um, and so the definition of this is, it's something that can predict and prevent injury, uh, um, predict and prevent injury um, and basically what you do is uh, you look at the workload over the last uh, four weeks compared to the workload over the last week. And so workload can be defined as miles or minutes. Uh, if you're a pitcher, maybe you're looking at pitches. Uh, you can do perceived exertion. Um, and there, it just sort of is sport dependent. But you find out what the workload is and you divide the last week over the, um, which is the numerator and the denominator is the last four weeks. And that will give you a ratio or a number and um, the values here that we'll talk about a couple times are if you end up less than 0.08, that means you're at risk for undertraining and you're at a high risk of injury. If you're in the, the sweet zone there, uh, 0.8 to 1.3, that's the goal and that's going to be um, the optimal training environment. And if you get uh, up above 1.5, that puts you at the danger zone of developing these overtraining uh, injuries. Uh, and that, that's the highest risk. That's higher risk, actually, than undertraining. 
this is a study from uh, the British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2016. Um, this is actually with cricket, Australian football, and rugby. But it, they found a really nice curve here. Uh, and so you can see that green zone in the middle, that's what you're shooting for. The, um, the x-axis there would be the acute on chronic workload ratio. So the 0.8 to 1.3, for example, is, is really where you're looking there. And that U-shaped curve, the bottom of the U, is the lowest risk uh, or the lowest likelihood of injury. And so that was the goal. But you can see to the left and the right of that, uh, it increased. And so if you're less than 0.8, you're going to be at risk of undertraining, and the risk of injury is higher. Well, if you're greater than 1.5, that's really where the, uh, the, the serious risk uh, occurs too. And so um, you're looking to stay in that 0.8 to 1.3 zone. And this was a nice study that demonstrated that. And I wanted to just take you through two examples. So the first one, imagine you're going to do the half day, uh, Earth Day half marathon next year in 2021, and you usually run a couple times a week, maybe two miles and one mile and three miles uh, for a total of six miles a week. And then maybe you're a physician or a nurse practitioner and you procrastinated, you, really, you need to kind of ramp up your mileage. So you jump up to three miles three times a week, which is not really that much of an increase if you think about it. Um, but if you divide nine by six, that puts you at 1.5, uh, which is the acute and chronic workload. And uh, that actually puts you in the danger zone. So you have to think about it when you're increasing the, your mileage or your pitches, for example. And the second example is quite a drastic one. Imagine you're a busy, active kid in February, you're playing sports, and all of a sudden you stop for four months, you don't do anything, and then on June 19th, uh, everyone gets back to work, and that's, uh, that was really a big setup. And um, I've been seeing a lot of those types of injuries here at St. Cloud Orthopedics, and I'm sure you probably have too, um, and this is about the time when you're going to develop them. Usually it's six to eight to ten weeks after you start your um, activities again, and so um, we've seen a lot of those types of injuries here at St. Cloud Orthopedics. Um, what about the pediatric athlete um, uh, makes them at risk for this? Um, well, we've defined the a uh, acute on chronic workload ratio, but um, what about kids is different than adults? And there's a couple things. Number one, it's just simply that they're not adults. Their bones are still growing. Um, the physis and epiphysis are weaker than the surrounding tissues, and so those are always at risk of injury. And they're usually the thing that's involved with these overuse injuries, as we'll see as we go through a couple different joints, you'll see it's usually the epiphysis or the physis that's involved. Um, their articular cartilage is still developing, and then those tendon and bone junctions uh, are developing too. So they're not just um, little adults. Um, intrinsic risk factors uh, for children when they're growing, a lot of them are going through growth spurts. Um, if you imagine the, the kids who are going through puberty, um, it, it seems like the bones go quicker than the muscles and the tendons can accommodate. So everything gets really tight, and that leads to a lot of malalignment. So that's one thing. And then uh, nutrition is always a role. And then, you know, lately in the last, um, you know, couple of years, we've seen certainly a rise in obesity and inactivity, which can uh, lead to intrinsic causes uh, of this overuse setup. And then extrinsic risk factors as well. Um, so the big thing that we're talking about here is the pandemic that we've seen that children are increasing their activities. But there's also a bunch of other things that uh, children struggle with. Technique. Maybe the equipment doesn't fit very well. They're playing on different types of service surfaces, which may not be appropriate for their level of play. Maybe they're, um, they're using the wrong type of equipment. And then um, the other thing is the early specialization where children are going from being kind of all around athletes to just specializing in one sport uh, too early, which can put them at risk for this injury as well. Here's a list of 10 of the most common um, pediatric sports injuries. And um, I'm going to touch on a couple of these today. It's going to be going to be sort of a grab bag with the whole understanding that a lot of these are related to that increase in their activities. Um, so probably the, one of the biggest one is, is patellar femoral pain syndrome. And Dr. Holtman speaks next, so she's going to uh, touch on this briefly. I'll let her talk about the knee. Um, we'll talk about some of the traction apophysitis uh, injuries, uh, including Oshkosh Slaughter is a pretty good example that everyone knows about. But there's a couple other ones that we'll talk about today. Uh, thrower's shoulder, um, some more uh, uh, elbow injuries there with the epicondyl avulsion. Dr. Botterill did a, a really nice job speaking about spondylolysis just recently. Um, and then there's uh, a bit of uh, talk about osteochondritis, gymnast wrist. We'll uh, talk about pelvic avulsion fractures and uh, little league your shoulder as well. So that's just sort of a summary of some of the most common injuries. So let's let's just divide it by um, extremity. So first we're going to look at the arm. 
so the upper extremity. Um, uh, injuries to the upper extremity in, in kids account for about 25% of uh, sport-related injuries. And if you think about a thrower, the elbow is really the weakest link uh, as you look at that uh, diagram of a, a person throwing a baseball there. It's not really the shoulder or wrist, it's the elbow that experiences the most, fork and, uh, the most force and that's going to be at risk when you're throwing. This is just sort of an overview of a few of the things we'll talk about here in the arm. And we'll first start with little leaguer shoulder. Um, this is actually a Salter Harris injury or um, uh, a, a physis fracture of the uh, proximal humeral physis in uh, usually um, arm uh, dominant pitchers. So for example, a right-handed pitcher will develop right-handed little leaguer shoulder. Uh, average age is 14, it's usually the dominant arm. And they'll usually present with uh, pain laterally um, it won't be necessarily up into their neck or trap. It'll just be pain laterally when they throw and, and also with palpation. Um, I have some radiographs here which will show a, a lateral um, widened physis. So I hope this projects okay, but if you look at the picture on the right, you can see sort of a normal humeral physis there. Uh, and then the picture on the left, which is actually the patient's right shoulder, sort of confusing, but the left side of the screen, uh, you can see a widened physis um, sort of on the lateral border compared to the other side. And so um, one of the principles I think that's important, especially with children with uh, these physeal injuries, is to get that contralateral view. And I think that will really help uh, you determine, especially in the elbow, what, what's supposed to look normal and what isn't. If, if you need a template, just get a picture of the other side. Um, but for example, on this one, you can see that the physis or that growth plate is widened on the, um, the right shoulder and the left side of the screen. What are some risk factors for little leaguer shoulder? Well, having an open uh, physis is number one. And then we think about throws. And so um, there was, when I was growing up, um, not too long ago, um, uh, we used to not be able to throw curveballs uh, until a certain age. And, but um, uh, Dr. Andrews down in Florida and Alabama has done a lot of research on this. And it's actually not breaking balls, which is the problem. It's actually the number of pitches and uh, other things like pitching fatigue, uh, not enough rest, uh, poor mechanics. The big thing is fatigue, um, and if you pitch fatigue, you're going to have uh, a, certainly a, a much greater risk of developing these injuries. Uh, the mechanism is that repetitive uh, torsion at the physis. Um, this is a really interesting study, I think, done by um, Jason Zarem Zaremski uh, at the University of Florida. He's the team doctor for um, Florida's baseball team, uh, their university, and uh, this was the AMSSM is a, our, our primary care sports medicine conference, and this was the case of the year. But the big thing he was looking at was unaccounted for throws. And so everyone talks about pitch count, and that's very important. And there's some guidelines for pitch count, which you can find at um, Pitch Smart, which is uh, developed by Major League Baseball um, in collaboration with a bunch of universities. And that's age-determined uh, pitch counts, which uh, you can kind of guide your athletes. But it, um, only looking at live pitches doesn't capture 42% of the pitches that those kids are throwing. If you think about bullpen, maybe throwing batting practice to their friends or throwing in the backyard with dad. So um, a lot of that is actually unaccounted for. And when you measure those unaccounted pitches, you can more accurately predict who's going to have an injury. And so the whole point is to not only think about live pitches. And then the second thing was by using that acute on chronic workload ratio, they were really able to predict which kids were going to get injuries and which uh, kids weren't. Um, and so that's, uh, I, just, I think, just a really great example of using that uh, ratio. When we think about treatment, a lot of these treatments are going to be the same with overuse injuries. But we're going to talk about rest for six to eight weeks, um, uh, really from any use of the, that upper extremity, and then back off from throwing for up to three months, gradually get them back into perhaps therapy with a thrower's program could help and then really think about that number of pitches, both live and non-live. Next up is dysfunctional thrower shoulder. So this is um, on the differential. Anytime someone comes in with shoulder pain, if they're a pitcher, um, the difference with this one would be the pain is actually usually coming from the shoulder blade. And if you have scapular dyskinesis, meaning your, your shoulder blades aren't tracking properly, or there's an imbalance of the uh, muscles around them in the shoulder girdle, it's going to put that rotator cuff at risk of getting sort of pinched. Um, this is much different. It's not going to hurt over the physis. It's going to be more um, kind of around the shoulder blade, and it's going to be more of a dynamic problem than just a palpation problem. Um, this can show up a year after you specialize, and there's a whole bunch of problem, problems that can lead to this. 
weakness in the core, weakness in the hip up, adductors, scapular dyskinesis like I talked about. And then uh, basically if you're close to your capsule tight and you lack that internal rotation, that's going to really put you at risk here too. And this will be like, imagine the 60 year old who comes in with shoulder impingement. These kids will have the same type of issue. So that Hawkins and Near are the two tests that we use for that. And those would be positive on these kids. Treatment will be um, avoidance of those types of activities. Um, this one is less severe than the ficeal injury. Um, you want to modify activities and get them on a thrower's rehab program to stretch out that posterior capsule, build up their traps and rhomboids, and really help their shoulder blade uh, move properly. So a referral to therapy uh, can help with this generally. Next up is the elbow. That's the weak link in this uh, thrower's arm. This is uh, just a reminder of those elbow ossification centers and the order in which they ossify. There's this nice uh, mnemonic crito, which reminds you um, uh, how they're supposed to ossify in which order. Uh, but remember, getting that contralateral elbow um, x-ray will really help you too. Um, now, the elbow is a group of problems, and it could be one of these things or it could be all of them. One of the things that we think about is medial epicondyle apophysitis. And so when uh, a pitcher or a thrower is throwing a ball, um, their elbow will rotate out in a valgus type of motion. Um, if you imagine just holding something heavy and throwing your arm forward, it's going to naturally fall into valgus. And so the first thing it's going to do is stretch the inside part of the elbow and pull on that medial um, uh, epicondyle apophysis, which is the, the um, I'll kind of see if I can get this to, there we go. So this is that medial epicondyle apophysis right through here. Um, that stress will continue and it'll actually load the back of the elbow. And so the capitellum, which is here, um, can develop some chondromalacia or even um, an oste osteochondritis desiccans, which is kind of chronic um, injury to the cartilage in the bone. Um, and then the other thing that can happen is actually on the front side, you can get some flexor strain. So if it's not the physis that's involved, perhaps it's the, um, uh, the flexors of the elbow that will be strained like a soft tissue injury. Um, so with Little League Elbow, um, 9 to 12 is the general presentation in an overhead thrower, pain with activity. Um, they're going to have maybe loss in velocity, loss in control. They'll have some swelling. This is more of a chronic, it's slowly getting worse and worse and worse type of presentation. Um, what you want to ask them about uh, is pitch count. Um, if it hurts on the inside, you could do a valgus stress. Um, or another way to uh, uh, um, test that is called a milking maneuver, which is where you have sort of give a valgus stress, and if, it, if you stress them and it hurts on the inside part of the elbow, that's going to um, be an indication that it, it might be on uh, that medial apophysis. Um, if it hurts on the outside part of the elbow or the, um, the lateral side of the elbow, that might be from uh, capitellar osteochondritis desiccans or perhaps um, maybe some softening of the cartilage. You can also attest, assess their core stability and then radiographs in an MRI. So here's an example of some radiographs, um, a nice contralateral view. Um, if we look at the left side through here, this is the medial um, uh, epicondyle apophysis. And if you compare that to the contralateral side, there's definitely, uh, definitely some widening of the apophysis or the physis through here um, compared to this side, which looks more normal. And so if you looked at this in general, you might think, um, I can't tell if that's what it's normally supposed to look like, because sometimes in children it does, but that gives you the importance of getting that contralateral um, x-ray. How are we going to treat it? It's mostly conservative management, rest them for four to six weeks. And again, therapy really helps with this to help um, uh, get them into a, a thrower's rehabilitation program, someone who really knows uh, what they're doing and is used to taking care of athletes. Um, Anti-inflammatories can help with this as well. Um, I skipped the osteochondritis desiccans. I thought it was a little deep, uh, perhaps, for this lecture. Um, but um, uh, essentially, um, that's one of the uh, syndromes that um, is, is involved with the elbow as well. Uh, but we'll move on to the medial epicondyle avulsion, which is more of an acute injury. So the apophysitis is the chronic slow wear and tear getting worse and worse and worse. The avulsion is, is when you have, usually it's a, a pain with a pop in one throw. Um, think about the UCL. So that's, the UCL is the ulnar collateral ligament. It's the Tommy John's ligament that you hear about a lot in, uh, on ESPN, for example, and that attaches to the medial uh, epicondyle. And so with children, uh, the second thing I'd like everyone to remember is that kids generally don't sprain stuff. 
is, which is what my mentor said at Vanderbilt. Um, and so a lot of times the, the ligaments and the tendons are stronger than the physis. And so rather than tearing their UCL, for example, they're going to fracture at the physis. And so that's a medial epicondyle avulsion fracture. So adults will tear the UCL. Children with open physis will usually um, evolve the physis. Uh, risk factor is number of pitches. Uh, this is an example of that. You can see uh, the picture on the right there. Um, there's clearly an abnormality. You could certainly get contralateral imaging, but you can see a sharp demarcation of where the fracture site is and the evulsion, evulsion right through here. Um, and then uh, this is going to, they're going to tell you it hurt when I threw one time. I felt the pop. Uh, my arm's painful. It's swelling. Uh, that valgus test where you put a, a valgus stress on their elbow is going to hurt them on the inside. Um, Radiographs will show you something like this, um, and then, uh, you know, usually we'll get an MRI to assess the integrity of the UCL and to see how much displacement it, there is of that um, epicondyle fragment. Uh, treatment, um, if it's non-displaced and the UCL looks like it's okay, and even if the UCL is torn, generally we're going to do this uh, with non-operative management where we'll do a long arm cast for something like four to six weeks and then progress them back with therapy. But once you start to see some uh, displacement or separation of the fracture fragment from where it was supposed to be sitting, um, especially in higher level athletes, we start to think about um, doing surgery. And that's, you know, certainly uh, a discussion that probably case by case basis, different surgeons would say different things. But um, especially if you're getting any displacement, that's uh, clearly a sign, in my opinion, that you should refer them to a surgeon for uh, further assessment. The last thing on the upper extremity, we're going to take a break from throwing here um, for a minute and get into gymnast wrists, um, which is something that um, is, uh, I think there's a couple of three uh, gym, gymnasts, uh, gyms around here, and so I've seen a, a bunch of gymnasts. Uh, but at any rate, um, one of the most common overuse injuries that they'll develop is this uh, repetitive uh, dorsiflexion injury on kind of the top part of their wrist where their watch face would be. Um, and that's just from loading that joint over and over again. Uh, what you can develop is bone bruising and even some synovitis at that joint. Uh, if you have it long enough, you can actually shut down the growth plate and uh, you can develop a made lung deformity. A couple more slides on this. This is going to be a gymnast who comes in and they say it hurts on the back of their wrist, right where their watch face would be. Um, they'll talk, you know, you can ask them about if you increase your activities, for example. Um, radiographs might show a couple different things or they might be normal. It could show if the growth plate's already closed that the ulna has moved and grown past the radius, which would be abnormal. It might show some bridging across the growth plate, which would be abnormal, um, or that uh, uh, made lung deformity if there's an irregular um, uh, 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 radial inclination of the distal radius. But at any rate, um, sometimes radiographs are irregular, but uh, they could also be normal. And then, um, you know, if you do get, end up getting an MRI, you might see some bone marrow bruising or you might even see that bridge that uh, um, connects the uh, epiphysis to the uh, proximal bone. This is an example of the gymnast wrist, and um, there's a circle on the right there. So if you look on the, the left side, on the left wrist, the radial physis here uh, is open. You can see that growth plate all the way through, and you compare that to the contralateral side, which certainly looks different. The ulnar physis is open, but the radial physis is closed. Um, which would be an indication that they may have had um, repetitive uh, loading and had premature closer, closure of that distal radial physis. Um, how do we treat it? Um, if it's a, a, you know, some just uh, more of a bone bruise injury, uh, you would give them rest, try some anti-inflammatories, change their technique, or these tiger paws here um, can be helpful and they just, as you can see, they limit that repetitive um, sort of deep dorsiflexion. Um, but once you get to that point where the growth plate is closed or there's a bridge, um, sometimes we do consider surgery. And so certainly at any point, um, if you could, um, are concerned about this, we'd be happy to see him here and uh, have a surgeon evaluate him for um, risk and benefits of surgery and to see if that was indicated. So that's sort of a whirlwind of the upper extremity. There's just a couple more things that I, I have uh, for you this evening. Um, the first one is pelvic apophyseal um, avulsion injuries. Um, and so I don't expect anyone to remember uh, what 
each hypothesis leads to with respect to each um, uh, muscle in the lower extremity. Um, but basically what I'd like you to remember is if you get an x-ray and it looks like there's something abnormal, just remember that you can just Google pelvic apophyseal injuries and you'll get a, a great image like this. Um, so for example, the one on the left here, um, this is the iliac crest. And so um, there'll be a, a, a great image which shows you that the abdominal muscle is mostly attached to that. The ASIS or anterior superior iliac spine is where the tensor fascia lata and sartorius uh, originate and then go down uh, the leg and then you can kind of read through it uh, otherwise. But um, this is a really good um, uh, way to remember um, what looks abnormal if you see an x-ray and you're not really sure something looks abnormal. It can be a little cheat sheet about what muscles might be evolved. And so um, there's sort of two types of injuries here. One would be the kind of the repetitive chronic apophysitis type of injury, and that's the one that's slowly progressive, worse and worse and worse. The other one would be a, an acute injury where actually you evolve the tendon off the bone. Um, this is this makes up up to 40% of pelvic fractures, so these are very common. And um, uh, it's very common for a kid to come into our office and say that they've had multiple pulled muscles in their hip, and they'll point to their iliac crest or something. And and uh, they just they say every year I pull I pull my hip muscle and it takes me a while to come back and uh, they just um, they just struggle with this year and year and year again and uh, if it's undiagnosed or um, uh, allowed to continue uh, to practice and play through this uh, they just lead to this kind of chronic irritation um, the mechanism for the acute injuries are those sudden contractions where the tendon pulls against that growth plate and actually can uh, break off of the growth plate. Um, and most of these are treated non-operatively is the big takeaway. I'm just going to talk about three specific ones here briefly. The most common ones, so the ischial tuberosity would be the hamstring. That's where the hamstrings are pulling on that bone. Imagine sitting on a wooden bleacher. You feel the bone that you're sitting on uh, on your buttocks. That's uh, that uh, ischial tuberosity, and that's where your hamstrings come off. And um, if you have a violent contraction of the hamstrings off that bone, you can actually uh, pull off the apophysis. This is common in hurdlers, long jumpers, and uh, they're going to have pain just like an, uh, an adult would say down the back side of their uh, buttock into their hamstring. Um, it can also impede their ability to walk with a normal gait. Uh, here's a picture. You can see the right where that, on the right side where that yellow arrow is. Um, it looks like there's a crescent moon that's actually pulled off the ischial tuberosity, and that's because the hamstring pulled that crescent moon off. Um, so that's an avulsion fracture. Um, treatment. Um, it says bed rest, but it's sort of when you can walk, you're, you can ab you're able to get up and walk with crutches. Um, uh, gradual return to activity, uh, very, very rare to do anything surgically for this. Most of the time you just let kids sort of let it uh, scar down, and then return to play would be about six to 12 weeks. The second one would be off the ASIS, or the anterior superior, superior iliac spine. That's where the sartorius and the sensor fascia lata uh, originate, and um, this is common in sprinters hurdlers and runners. Um, they'll say they felt a pop. Here's a picture of what that might look like. Um, and if you look up sort of right through here, um, that you can see that there's a little fragment uh, which is not present on the other side. So this is abnormal. That's the ASIS right here. Um, and you might see some displacement. Uh, treatment again, even if there's some displacement, oftentimes we're going to treat these non-operatively with activity modification, crutches, and then some physical therapy to help them strengthen up on the way back to uh, sport. The next one is the AIIS, uh, which is the anterior inferior iliac spine, and that's where the rectus femoris originates. Also common in sprinters coming out of the bo uh, blocks or kicking injuries, uh, soccer, for example. They'll have pain over the groin. It hurts if you extend their hip or flex their knee, have a hard time walking. And there's a good example of an AIIS. So the ASIS was more up here. You couldn't really see it. This is AIIS coming off uh, just superior to where the femoral head is. And so you can see that avulsion right through here where the tendon pulled off that apophysis. Uh, this is also bed rest, crutches, uh, until they're able to bear some weight. And then usually it's about a six-week return to play. Last but not least would be a hip flexor off the lesser trochanter. These are all pretty similar. I just wanted everyone to see sort of what the imaging looked like. And so if you see this image here, on the left, uh, this is a normal lesser trochanter. And if you look on the right, there's some separation where um, the, the hip flexor, which is uh, coming down from the superior aspect uh, from your um, 
uh, iliacus and psoas muscle uh, in origin, in, um, inserts on hip, uh, lesser trochanter is pulled off a little fragment. So this is going to also be an ability to walk. Um, if you set them on a, a table and you ask them to lift their knee against resistance, they may not, might not be able to do that. And there's a picture of it. This is also crutches, bed rest if they can't walk, but we really try to get them up and around as quick as we can. And it's a little longer return to play, about 12 weeks. And I just have one foot and ankle case here. Um, and this is Seaver's, uh, Seaver's apophysitis. This is probably the most common cause for young children to have uh, heel pain. It's also acute on chronic uh, increase. Um, uh, if you increase your activities, you're at risk. Um, it's pain with activity, hurts on the back of the heel. Certainly in athletics, um, the athletic population would be at higher risk. Uh, risk factors would be tight uh, Achilles and calves. Um, and then point tenderness at the lateral calcaneus. X-ray might look like this, where you have some fragmentation and sclerosis, but to be honest, that looks like a lot of normal X-rays, so it's helpful to get that contralateral view. And then um, treatment would be therapy, stretching, heel cups can be helpful, and some anti-inflammatories. So just to summarize, I have just a couple points here. Remember that acute and chronic workload ratio. I think that that um, is something that we can apply broadly to our athletes when they're trying to get back into sport. Um, uh, Remember that uh, the overuse injuries are becoming more common, especially as they go through that growth spurt. Uh, breaking balls are okay, uh, but the total pitches is generally what counts. And if you need a little more guidance, you could go to uh, Pitch Smart, which is at the MLB's website. Um, and, and remember to try to count all the pitches if you can. Um, and then children aren't little adults. So uh, there were a couple of reasons why we talked about uh, um, uh, it, it's important to distinguish the difference. And most of these, in fact, I think almost all of these respond well to conservative therapy um, with just a few requiring surgery. I just put one more slide uh, so you could have it. This is my kind of cheat sheet. These are all the um, traction apophysitis and their um, eponyms. So uh, Cindy larsen johansson for example, is an inferior pulvic patella. But there's Seaver's disease, Iceland's in the foot, and then um, those are the other ones that we've talked about um, with the shoulders. And then Dr. Holtman has the knee. Some references, and uh, that's it. Yep. Great, thank you, Dr. Merrick, for joining us here today to talk about the uh, overuse athletes uh, in the pediatric population. Um, so, uh, and thank you to the audience again for sending in questions. Uh, so, the first one uh, is: is uh, what what point is soreness in a pediatric athlete uh, concerning for for an overuse injury? Uh, that's a good question. I think. Um, Probably if it's repetitive and, um, you know, if it's something that, uh, you know, let's take um, uh, maybe the Seavers disease, for example, the, the one that we talked about last. If it's something that's persistent and it's not going away with a day or two of rest and you get to the next practice after a day or two of rest and it's still hurting you, uh, that's, you know, a time when I would consider resting a little longer, taking a little break or probably being evaluated. So. Um, persistent pain despite rest, I think, uh, would be my red flag. At what point in time would you consider x-rays? Um, I almost always get x-rays um, uh, just because, um, you know, some of these things that we talked about have to do with displacement. And especially if there's an acute injury, I would always get them because we're going to look for um, any displacement of the apophysis, for, for example. Um, but even those chronic injuries, um, one thing I didn't talk about tonight is a stress fracture, and certainly that can happen too, and that's uh, one of the things that we'd have to distinguish uh, between. And so um, generally I am getting x-rays, um, uh, um, and I recognize radiation, but um, I think the benefits outweigh the risk. Is there a, a certain uh, indication either from history or your physical exam or the time that you would then go to further imaging and what imaging would you recommend? Uh, good question. I think, um, you know, a lot of these things respond well to conservative measures. And so um, if I think it's, for example, Seavers disease or um, one of those kind of slowly progressive processes that can get better with rest and therapy, I'm more likely to just recommend uh, just conservative measures without advanced Im imaging such as an MRI. However, as you get older and the athletes are more competitive and time is, is more crucial to them, um, and in the setting of acute injuries, I'm much more likely to pull the trigger on an MRI. 
especially if they have other findings like weakness or if they have in the knee, for example, fluid in the knee. Almost every time I see fluid in the knee, I'm going to get an MRI. Um, and so I would say the older athletes, the acute injuries uh, are the ones that I'm more likely to pull the trigger on an MRI. What's the magic number for the pitch count? And has, has that been steady or has that changed? Yeah, uh, good question. It's definitely changed, uh, I think. Um, even more recently, uh, from that Zaremski study I was telling you about, we're trying to track all pitches now. But if you go to uh, Pitch Smart on MLB's website, um, I think it'll tell you that seven-year-olds should stay under 50 pitches uh, per outing. And, um, and then it'll say, based on how many, if they threw 40 pitches, they should have three days rest. If they threw 30, they could have two days rest, for example. So, but I think the max on a, a, a seven or eight-year-old would be about 50. And I think at 18 is, is right around 100, 18-year-olds. Uh, so, and that's pretty similar to what we're seeing from the Major League Baseball. They're pretty strict about those, especially the Twins. They're pretty strict about their 100-pitch outings. And, um, and so I think that's a good starting spot recognizing we're getting better at all the, all the time, uh, counting those non-live pitches. And uh, one last question for you. Um, are, are injections appropriate for these type of injuries, uh, kind of like we would for, for an adult? Uh, uh, and if you were to recommend an injection, is there a certain type of injections that you like to do? Good question. Um, not not. Typically for these, I think um, a lot of these are just sort of those growth plate injuries. Um, we're trying to limit our steroid use in children all the time anyway, um, but um, a lot of these things improve with conservative measures. Um, and I can't really think of much um, other than, you know, um, yeah, I think it'd be pretty rare for these, the, these overuse type of injuries that I've talked about uh, to uh, recommend any sort of type of steroid injections. At the upper level, certainly once you get to college, uh, there's some, some emerging data about um, things like biologic injections, like blood injections, but for children with overuse injuries, I wouldn't recommend that. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Merrick, for joining us today to talk about the uh, pediatric uh, uh, athlete and overuse injuries. Uh, appreciate you uh, being here with us today. Uh, we will uh, uh, pause for one moment and get the, uh, the uh, uh, last uh, speaker, Dr. Holtman, all set up and ready to go. We're good to go. You're on. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We have our last speaker for the evening. Uh, this is Dr. Christy Holtman. She joined us uh, last year. She is an orthopedic surgeon who did a, a sports medicine fellowship. Uh, she is uh, uh, here today to talk about knee pain in the young athlete. So I'd like to turn it over to Christy Holtman. Uh, we will encourage you to, again to continue with your questions. Really appreciate those coming in. Uh, and we will do a, a, a question and answer session once we're all done with her. And then we will uh, close, the, close up the uh, CME with some uh, uh, remarks at the end. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Holtman. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for staying so late. Um, I'm going to talk about knee pain in the young athlete, okay? If you have any questions while I'm talking, feel free to send them in, um, and we'll get those responses to you. Um, Okay, so we're going to talk about some common injuries to the knees that we see in athletes. So we're going to look at anterior knee pain, patellar instability, meniscus lesions, osteochondral lesions, and ACL injuries, among some other topics. So we're going to kind of roll here to make sure that we get a chance to cover everything. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to send them in. So one of the great things about orthopedics is a lot of information is gathered by just doing the history and a physical exam. So even though they're kids, you really want to make sure that you ask them what happened. Is this something that came on suddenly? Was it acute? Did they get hit? Did they fall? Um, is this something chronic that's been going on for a while? So a lot of that is going to direct both your exam and what your diagnosis is. The next really important part is the physical exam. So think back to your training. Remember, inspection, palpation, range of motion and strength, and special tests. So instead of just the knee hurts, where does it hurt? Um, I always tell the med students and the residents when you're palpating, palpate with a purpose. Know what you're feeling and what are you feeling for? Where are they tender? Because this is really going to help you diagnose these conditions. Okay? Um, look at their, look at what they look like. Is the knee really swollen? Is, does it look deformed? Do they, is their leg nice and aligned or are they knock kneed? Are they bow legged? Are their prominences sticking out? You know, so, so kind of really make sure that you're looking at the, that knee and evaluating it as you go. See if they're moving it. Are they putting weight on it? And then have some special tests in your pocket to really help you hone down on that uh, diagnosis. We'll talk about x-rays. A lot of times we do get x-rays. Sometimes we're just making sure there's nothing else going on there. But it does give us some information. I know we're not all radiologists, but it's, it's really important to take a look at those x-rays. Don't just wait, wait for the read to come in, but take a look at it and just get used to looking at it. See that fracture. Look to see if it's normal. These are things that, that you can do. Um, and we'll talk about when it's appropriate to do some advanced imaging and coming up with some plans for these. So starting off, anterior knee pain. So this is kind of the low back pain of the knee. It encompasses a number of different diagnoses like patellofemoral pain, osgood schlatter Cindy Glarkson, Johansson, uh, patellar tendonitis. All of these things kind of encompass, I have pain in the front of my knee, okay? This pain is often gradual and insidious onset. It's typically not all of a sudden my knee hurts, but it's kind of been getting worse and worse and worse, okay? These patients typically do not have complaints of locking, giving way, buckling. It's not very mechanical. It just hurts. There's usually not a lot of swelling associated with this either. Okay? Um, so we'll start off with patellofemoral knee pain, also known as anterior knee pain, runner's knee, chondromalacia of the patella. So a bunch of diagnoses, kind of a grab bag of just sore anterior knee that I can't um, this is very common, particularly in adolescent females. There's two kind of main body types that you'll see this on. First is that really thin, flexible girl that doesn't really do very much activity-wise. They're not very strong. And with the advent of lots of video games, we do also see this in adolescent boys as well that tend to spend more time sitting and not as much time outside. The other patients that we tend to see this a lot in are the overweight patients that are not very active as well because they don't have that leg strength, okay? So some contributing factors to this anterior knee pain are things like 
larger Q angle. So the Q angle is measured by going from the, AS, the ASIS up at the hip down to the patella, and then a line from the patella to the tibial tubercle. That angle kind of tells us how the muscles are pulling on the knee and what the forces are. So a larger Q angle, which you'd see in more of a, a knock knee type patient, has a larger pull to the outside, which kind of has that destabilizing nature to the knee, so the kneecap can move around a bit more, gets a little irritated. Other things we see are weaker quad muscles, particularly the VMO, the medial um, quad muscle there. If it's not as strong, you get a greater pull on the lateral side and the kneecap has some motion within the groove. That goes along with tight hamstrings and tight IT bands. So if you're tight on the outside and weak on the inside, you're not really tracking nice within the knee and you're getting some micro motion that causes irritation. We also see this as a repetitive injury, so overuse in people that are doing lots of running and activities like that where they just get irritation underneath that kneecap. These patients present with kind of dull anterior knee pain that's very poorly localized. It's not really a point. They're just like, it hurts under my knee. It hurts in the front of the knee. Um, they may complain of difficulty going up and down stairs, um, walking on uneven terrain, um, even just flexing the knee because it gets so irritated. So looking at this, you don't necessarily have to measure that Q angle, but when you're looking at these patients, so normal alignment has a Q angle that's less than 15 degrees. When you see these knock knee patients where their Q angle is greater than 20 degrees, that lateral pull to the patella just can affect the alignment and the tracking of the patella. Um, similarly, bow-legged, it's not usually as much of a problem, but it can cause some irritation. So looking at the, at the image on the right side of your screen, that kind of shows you those two lines, the first one coming from up at the hip down to the patella, and that kind of shows you the line that the quad muscles are pulling in. And you see they pull a little bit laterally. So the more or the sharper of a Q angle that you have, the more lateral pull you have. And that just affects it um, a bit more. And again, the vastus medialis on the inside part of the knee, if it's not strong, it's not really holding that kneecap in good position. So when you're examining these patients, again, palpate with a purpose. You want to palpate along that extensor mechanism, feel the sides of the patella, the facets. Are they tender there? Um, look at the motion. So as they're bending and straightening their leg, is the patella sliding nicely in the groove? Or do they have what's called a J sign? When they go into extension, does it kind of pop up over to the side? Um, do you feel crepitus under there? Is it popping? Um, other things to do a patellar grind. So just lightly pressing down on the patella with your thumbs and kind of wiggling it back and forth. Is that irritating? Is it painful? Quad activation, take your fingers and press down just above the superior pole of the patella and have them activate their quad muscles, tightening it. They may get some discomfort with that as well. Um, some key special tests to do are the step down test. Have them stand on top of a stool take a step down and watch their knee. It should be nice and aligned. If they're stepping down and there's wiggle, they're going into a valgus movement, they don't have the appropriate amount of leg strength and they need to work on that. Similar to single leg squat, an adolescent should be able to do a squat with one leg without falling over. If they can't do that with good balance, they need to work on their leg strength. You can do x-rays in these patients, but they're typically normal. Unless there's something really concerning with their exam, you can usually start um, with treating them and strengthening before you do x-rays, but no one will fault you for getting x-rays on them. These are typically treated with conservative management, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, activity modification. A lot of people don't like activity modification. You'll see this in runners because runners run, but they don't build muscle, so they tend to be weak. They have endurance, but they don't have leg strength. So um, for this, therapy is really important, making sure that they're really strengthening those muscles. That's going to help with their patella tracking and correcting kind of their alignment. This is not something we do surgically for, um, and we want to avoid that. So strengthen, strengthen, strengthen. Okay. Going along with this is patellofemoral instability. There's two main kinds of instability. So the first is acute traumatic dislocation. These are normal kids. They're usually playing activities. and 
Um, they either get hit in the side of the knee or they twist and pop it out. Um, this is more of a traumatic dislocation. They have big swelling. Um, it's very painful. One of the risks with this is they have up to a 70% reoccurrence rate. So it's important to make sure that we treat this. Um, there's also the atraumatic subluxation. These kids tend to be ligamentously lax. They're often female. They may have some malalignment issues, patella alta, and it can be recurrent. These tend not to have as much swelling and pain associated because they're just lax and it's easy for it to slide out. Um, the age range, uh, 10 to 17, is the highest risk. This mechanism, again, is usually a non-contact. They're twisting their leg in extension, sometimes going into flexion of the knee and the kneecap just pops out from that lateral pull. Um, so in this injury, they can have an osteochondral injury, meaning they break off a bone and cartilage fragment. This usually occurs as the patella comes back in and not as it's going out. So this image is kind of showing you what we see with this patella dislocation. The patella slides out, and as it's coming back, the medial side of the patella is going to bang up against the lateral femoral condyle. And that's where you get those chondral lesions from and you get the bony bruising. The other thing that can happen is tear of the MPFL. Um, in stretchy patients, it may not tear, um, this, but in tra traumatic um, uh, dislocations, it does tend to tear. Um, and they'll get pain along the medial side of the patella, the lateral femoral condyle, and then on the medial side near that attachment of the MPFL. So oftentimes you'll get pain kind of right in this area on the medial side where it's detached. Okay, so some risk factors for patellus double instability. Ligamentous laxity, if you're loose, it's easier for things to fall out of place. Um, previous instability events, so once you dislocate once, you are at an increased risk of dislocating again. The miserable malalignment syndrome. So these are people with femoral antiversion, so their knees kind of internally point rotated, the genu valgum, so their knock kneed, and external tibial torsion or pronated feet. So these people with this alignment where the knees are pointed in and they're knock kneed, they're at increased risk of dislocating just due to the force vectors on that knee. Um, some anatomical factors associated with it, patella alta, so the kneecap generally engages in that trochlear groove at the end of the femur around 30 degrees. If your kneecap sits higher up, you have to bend the knee further to engage within that groove, which means you have more time to dislocate and get off course. Okay, bony abnormalities. So everybody's knee's a little different. Some people have flatter grooves, which offer less protection. Some people have hypoplasia of the lateral femoral condyle. Um, these are factors that are just built into the patient and we can control them, but unless it's very severe, it's something that it just kind of is what it is with the patient. The weak VMO and the tight lateral structures, like we talked about for an anterior knee pain, max optimizing these is going to help stabilize that kneecap. And if they're weak and tight, that's when they can lead to some problems. So symptoms on these patients, they come in with pain, instability. If it was traumatic, you can see a lot of swelling and a hemarthrosis. If they don't have a lot of swelling, again, that's usually more something that was due to laxity or habitual dislocations. Again, that tenderness on the medial side of the patella, the medial and lateral femoral condyles, um, and you may see some increased passive patellar translation. The patella um, should usually be able to translate about one quadrant, so 25% to the side. More than two quadrants is abnormal, but again, you've got to compare to both sides. You can't just compare one. Now, if they come in and they're very painful, they're going to clench down. They're not going to let you do this. Um, they need to be relaxed in order to get an accurate assessment. Patellar apprehension, they do not like when you try to push their kneecap out of place. Um, again, you may see an increased Q angle or knock need, and that J sign when you're um, coming from flexion into extension. Um, that can be associated with patella alta and some maltracking issues. Um, on these patients, we always get x-rays, um, weight-bearing if you can get them, AP, lateral, and sunrise. What you want to look for is in the lateral view, you can look at the patellar height. I like to do the Caton de Champs index, um, and that's just the ratio of the height from the patella to the tibia versus the length of the patella, as you can see in that image. Normal is one. There is a range that's acceptable. The other thing you want to look for in these images are fragments or loose bodies. Anytime there's a loose bony piece in there, 
And it's like having a rock in your shoe, that's something that needs to be treated and you need to try and catch that if you can. Now, x-rays miss about 40% of these osteochondral lesions, so often we will do advanced imaging to make sure that there are no loose bodies within the knee. Additionally, looking in the sunrise view, um, that's where we can look to see, is there a lateral patellar tilt, although that can be complicated by swelling within the knee. You can also look at the trochlea. Does it look shallow? Does it look asymmetric? And that can give you some additional information as well. That being said, a lot of patients have these asymmetries and shallow trochleas on both sides and one knee is stable. Okay, so a lot of times we'll get an MRI on this patient. Nobody will fault you for getting an MRI after a patella um, dislocation because we want to rule out any loose bodies, particularly in a kid. So anytime there's a traumatic dislocation, they're having mechanical symptoms, there's catching, locking, popping, anything like that, go ahead and get that MRI of the knee. Um, and you're going to see some osteochondral lesions or bone bruising from where the patella smacks the lateral side of the, of the femur. Um, you may also see a little bit of edema or bone bruising at the attachment to the MPFL. This will also allow you to assess the MPFL and see if there's tearing there. Okay. Um, so what do we do for this? So in a first-time dislocator that doesn't have any loose body and we don't see any intraarticular damage, we can treat this with anti-inflammatories and physical therapy. So we brace it, we let it calm down for a couple weeks, and then we start physical therapy to stabilize that patella. You can also do this in a habitual dislocator, someone that has this tendency to dislocate. For patients that do have loose bodies, they're an active athlete, um, or have recurrent instability, or anytime there's a displaced uh, OCD lesion, they get surgery, we do the repair of the MPFL or deconstruction, as well as a scope to remove any loose bodies from the knee. Okay. So moving on, next, Osgood Schlatter. So Dr. Merrick talked a little bit about these traction injuries. So this is a tibial tubercle apophysitis. Um, basically, there's too much traction on that tibial tubercle while you're growing, and it causes some irritation with that repetitive micro micro trauma. Um, this is very common during the adolescent growth spurt, uh, particularly in boys as well as girls. Males 10 to 15 years. Uh, females tend to happen about two years sooner. Um, it is bilateral in 20 to 30 percent of uh, patients. Um, and this is very common, particularly in jumping sports or anything where there's really explosive activity of the leg. So basketball, volleyball, sprinters. Um, this is a self-limiting condition. It will resolve once the growth plate closes. However, it can be irritating and very frustrating for patients. These patients are going to present with pain, particularly worse with direct pressure right over that tibial tubercle. Um, they're going to be okay at rest. If they take a couple days off, they feel better. But every time they go and do that sport, they get that irritation back again. They may have swelling. This swelling is going to be localized over the tibial tubercle. It is not going to be a big swollen joint. It should stay down at that tibial tubercle. You, these ones are ones that you see walking into clinic and you're like, oh, that guy's got Osgood Schlatter's because they usually have this big bump. You'll see them in adults coming in. Hey, did your knees bother you when you were a teenager? Um, so in these patients, um, you can get x-rays to rule out things like cysts and tumors. Um, it is something that you can treat without getting x-rays. No one will fault you for getting x-rays, um, but it is fairly, um, fairly common with its presentation that you can start treating it right away. Um, Treatment-wise, anti-inflammatories, ice stretching activity modification. You can use a show pad strap. Um, some patients will use the foam pre-wrap or tape or pretty much whatever they like rolled underneath um, just below the knee. Um, and that's attempted to offload the patellar tendon some. That is not the only treatment. You cannot just do the show pad strap. You have to do anti-inflammatories and stretching and therapy and some kind of maintenance type activities to really help the knee. This is something that does not resolve overnight. It takes, you know, 18 to 24 months to fully resolve. Some patients are able to just manage the symptoms and get through it. Other patients, they have such severe pain that you need to shut them down. To do that, you immobilize them for about six weeks. 
give them an immobilizer. They can remove it every day to do some exercises, but they really need to, re to rest it or it's just going to keep flaring up and be irritated. This is something that we typically do not do surgery for, except for very rare refractory cases where it's just so painful. Um, and occasionally in skeletally mature patients where they just have this persistent symptoms even after closure of the growth plates. But again, a lot of times this is just managing symptoms um, and finding a way to control it. Formal physical therapy can help as well, just help maintain and manage the pain. Similarly, there's the Cindy larsen johansson syndrome, which is basically the same thing, but instead of being at the tibial tubercle, this is up at the inferior pole of the patella. Same um, age group, it's males in the growth spurt years, um, worse with running, jumping, um, climbing up and down stairs, those types of activities where you're really stressing that extensor mechanism. Um, on exam of these patients, they will be tender along the inferior pole of the patella. This also resolves over time in response to physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, and activity modification. Okay. So now we'll look at some common intraarticular um, knee injuries. So we're going to look at osteochondral lesions, ACL injuries, and meniscus lesions. So osteochondritis dissecans is a lesion of the cartilage and the subchondral bone where you get this defect at the articular surface that separates from the rest of the bone. We don't know exactly why it happens. It could be ischemia, repetitive microtrauma, just genetics. Um, we're really not sure. And these patients present with vague, poorly localized pain. They usually say it's in the knee. Sometimes they can give you a side, but it's not something they can easily point to. These patients, as the disease progresses, tend to get mechanical symptoms, um, particularly if they've got a loose fragment developing. They tend to have these recurrent effusions within the knee, and they can also have some swelling, stiffness, and just diffuse tenderness within the knee. So these images here are kind of showing you what those OCD lesions look like. Um, and as you can see in A, B, and C, it's kind of showing you the progression as it starts from a small lesion, it gets bigger um, and kind of radial loosened around it, and then you get that loose fragment. So here's some additional pictures shown on the MRI and an x-ray. Again, this is something that you need to look for. So when you're taking those x-rays, take a look at it and see if you can identify it, okay? Because um, it is something that can be easily missed, particularly um, early on. Um, and so, um, in the juvenile with an open growth plate, they do have a better prognosis. That open physis tells us that they do have a better chance of it healing. Now, 80% of these are going to be in the posterior lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. This is difficult to see on x-ray. It's easier if you do a notch view. So when you take an x-ray of the knee and you think there might be an OCD lesion in there, when you get the AP, have them do a regular AP and have them do a notch view with the legs slightly flexed. That gives us a better look at the posterior condyle. Um, lesions that show up in the patella or on the lateral femoral condyle tend to have a poorer prognosis. They don't follow our usual pathway. When we're looking at these, what we look at, particularly in the MRI, is is the cartilage intact? If the cartilage intact is, or if the cartilage is intact, then almost all of those will heal. Once we get fluid behind that lesion, that's a poor prognosis because bone is not very good at healing when it's in a bath of joint fluid. So these lesions we classify based on stability and displacement, and that lets us know kind of what we can do with them. So get that x-ray if you're concerned about this knee pain. You definitely want to get an x-ray. Remember, get that notch view because the tunnel or notch view lets us see that portion of the femoral condyle. And also MRI, that's going to let us assess that lesion and figure out where are we at and what do we need to do with it. So type 1, we see that bony lesion, but the cartilage is still intact and it's still really easy to heal that one. Type 2, you've got some disruption of the cartilage, but it's still partially in place. That still has a chance to heal in position if we treat it correctly. Once we get to type 3, we've got complete disruption of that cartilage and we're, we're moving more towards an unstable type defect. And then type 4, you've got that loose body in there. It's completely disrupted um, the cartilage and the bone, and that's something that needs to be treated.
the gold standard for assessing the stability is, is um, a scope, but we can get a lot of information from the MRI as well. Okay, so what do we do with that? So in a skeletally immature patient with a stable lesion that's asymptomatic, we can treat that with just um, activity modification and knee immobilization. And 50 to 75% of these are gonna heal. Now, if you're not sure, send this to ortho. It's, it's okay to refer this, we will manage it, but it's something that we wanna, you know, if you pick up on it, that's awesome. Type three and four, so once you've got fluid behind that lesion, you've completely disrupted your cartilage, that's a lot more difficult to, to heal, or if the physis is starting to close, it's less likely to heal. Those are all things that are gonna be treated operatively, okay? So these are showing you some images of these lesions. So the one at the top, it's actually a loose fragment that's floating around within the knee, again, like having a pebble in your shoe. The one below it, you can see that the cartilage is partially intact, but that lesion is not stable and it's starting to come off. Those get caught in the knee. They have mechanical symptoms. It's irritating and it should be stabilized. Okay, so what do we do when we fix these? So when you send us those patients with these lesions, what do we do? Sometimes the cartilage or the condition of that fragment is not in good condition. So we drill some holes and we try to get some some scar tissue cartilage to grow in that area to allow that motion. Um, sometimes we can take that fragment, so looking in the, the uh, bottom left hand side, we repair it with some absorbable screws and just put that piece back where it is. Um, sometimes we take their own cartilage cells and we inject it into a patch on the knee and kind of fill that defect. And sometimes we take bone plugs from cadaver and we put that in there to give them that, that cartilage and bone back. So there's a bunch of different techniques that we use to try to repair that to give them as much use out of that knee as possible and minimize that arthritis development. Okay, so the anterior cruciate, cruciate ligament, this is the big injury that everybody's worried about. So the ACL prevents your tibia from sliding forward under the femur. Um, so this injury is usually a sudden direction change. They land off balance when they're jumping, hyperextension injury. The most common thing you will get from these patients is that they hear a pop, they have immediate pain and swelling, and a lot of times they can't walk on it afterwards, they usually stop playing, okay? The side note for this is in very young children, instead of tearing that ACL, they will have a fracture to the tibial eminence, similar to Merrick was talking about, that ligament is strong, the growth plate is not, okay? Female athletes sustain four to eight times more ACL injuries than male. Um, there's a lot of theories as to why this happens. We don't exactly know. It seems to have some neuromuscular um, reasoning behind it, though, where their motion and the way they control their body is just not optimal. So you can see in that bottom picture, there's the proper alignment for running, and then you see the hip drop, the knees kind of collapsing in. You're putting yourself in a position of risk to tear that ACL. There are some training programs that we can do to help minimize this risk. When these patients come in, they come in with pain. They may have a lot of swelling in the knee. They may have limited weight bearing. Some of them will complain of instability. They'll say, my knee feels sloppy. Other times, because of how much swelling and pain they have, they have decreased range of motion, and it's hard to feel that instability because they just can't move it. When you do that Lockman's test, that's where you're feeling for that laxity and pulling that tibia forward. You wanna make sure you've got your, your inside thumb on that tibia, feel it coming forward in front of the femoral condyles. Pivot shift is another test you can do. It's very difficult to do when they're awake because they do not like to let you do it. You're gonna internally rotate the tibia and apply a valgus stress while you bring the knee from extension into flexion and you may feel the knee kind of reduce as you bring it up, a little shift. Okay, again, exam may be limited. If you're concerned about an ACL injury, get an MRI. Okay, on the MRI, so an image on the left shows you the normal ACL. Sometimes it's at an angle and hard to see. When you get a torn ACL, that's not there, so you're looking for the structure not to be there. And you get this bony bruising on the top and the bottom where the front of the femur hits the back of the tibia, okay? We fix it using grafts, either the hamstrings, the patellar tendon, or the quad tendon, and we simply run it through and attach and make a new ACL. There is a lot of physical therapy that is associated with this once they get a repair. 
Most young people should definitely get a repair. It helps stabilize the knee and minimizes further injuries to the knee. Okay, so if you get an ACL tear in an adolescent, they should be referred to orthopedics. Um, and then this is showing the tibial eminence fracture in younger patients. Again, make sure you get that MRI and take a look at it. Look for that fragment right in the center. So right in this area here, you see this elevated piece. That's the bone attached to the bottom of the ACL. Sometimes you can put them in extension and get that to reduce, but a lot of times you can't, but we can repair it and pull it back down. This is something that if you see, put them in a knee immobilizer and send them to orthopedics, okay? Here's how we repair that. We basically suture that end and anchor it down through the bone to pull it back into place, all right? Moving on to meniscus tears. This is very common in adolescents. Medial meniscus is more common except for after an ACL where the lateral meniscus is more common. Um, they are at increased risk in ACL deficient knees, so either tearing it when they tear the ACL or tearing it because they are unstable secondary to not having an ACL. These patients will localize their pain to a side. It either hurts on the inside or the outside. They can often point to exactly where it hurts. They'll have mechanical symptoms like snapping, locking, clicking, particularly with movements such as squatting, lifting things bending the knee. Um, they may have intermittent swelling, so it may be swollen, it may swell at times and then improve. These patients on exam will have tenderness along the joint line. You may palpate a bump or a perimeniscal cyst that is very tender. They will have swelling and an effusion to the knee. When you do the McMurray's test, so what you're doing is you're putting stress by their val varus or valgus and moving that knee to really crank in on that meniscus and see if it causes pain. Another test is the Thessaly's test, where they stand on that injured leg and you have them bend the knee and rotate it on a little bit. If, it, if they have a meniscus tear, that will hurt. Other tests, the bounce test, so um, flex their knee up as you flex them to the ends, to the extremes of flexion, they will have pain on the side of the meniscus tear, as well as hyper uh, or hyperextension. So bring their leg all the way straight, put a little pressure on the thigh, and that can also cause pain due to a meniscus tear. Okay, so children have more vascular meniscus, so they have greater healing potential. In children, we try to repair as much as possible if we can. Um, we typically get x-rays in these patients and they are normal. The MRI is the most sensitive way to see the tear. If you suspect that a patient has, an F, has a meniscus tear, get that imaging. Okay, so there's different types of meniscus tears. When we get that MRI, we look for that bright line in the black triangle. So in this, M in this MRI, in the center, center image, we have these black triangles, that is the meniscus. This white line that goes in towards the joint, that is that tear, that is what we're looking for. Okay, different types of tears have different outcomes. Some are easier to heal than others. The one that we really want to make sure we identify is that bucket handle meniscus tear. So these patients oftentimes will come in and they cannot move their leg. Their leg is stuck. If you try to flex it, you try to extend it, they do not want to move it. They do not like to put weight on it. It is very painful. Sometimes these do not swell as much because they're locked in position and not moving it. So this is showing you an image. So here's the lateral femoral condyle here. Here's our ACL coming through the notch. And this is that meniscus that's flipped up. So instead of being around the outside of the knee, it is flipped up under that condyle and then it's stuck. They cannot move it. When we look at it on MRI, we see um, what looks like a double PCL sign where it looks like there's two of them. And that is the meniscus up in the notch. And same thing in the front one, we can see um, the ligament and then there's that um, meniscus stuck in that notch area. So it gets stuck in there and it's very painful when you move it, you're pulling on that torn portion of meniscus. And this one, this is one that we try as much as possible to repair. So you can see in this image those, those sutures placed in the meniscus, holding it back into position. Um, and the bucket handle meniscus tear, this is something that you want to get to ortho as soon as possible and you want to repair it as soon as possible. Anytime you have a patient where they can't weight bear and they can't move their leg, get x-rays, send it to ortho, okay? And then avoid pitfalls. So one of the things, particularly in children, hip pain can be referred to the knee. If they come with 
hip pain and you're not really seeing one of these common diagnoses, examine that hip and make sure that there's nothing going up, up there. Make sure there's no skiffy, there's no Perthes disease or anything like that going on up there. Okay, and questions? Well, very good. Thank you, Dr. Holtman, for, uh, for the excellent uh, review of knee pain in the uh, young athlete. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up tonight uh, with some uh, questions uh, uh, from the audience. So, at, at, uh, so the braces you talked about for the non-traumatic non knee pain, are, are those over-the-counter or are those uh, prescription? Um, so depending on which ones you do, so when you're doing the show pat strap, um, that is something that typically can be over-the-counter, um, but if you're sending them to physical therapy, they can also fit it and make sure that they're appropriately wearing it. Gotcha. Is there something uh, from an exam standpoint that you say, you know, these people should need an MRI, these people should uh, need some other studies? And, and the question ultimately is, is should, should the primary care person evaluating them, should they order the MRI or should they leave it up to referral? So I would say for, for most of these, Getting a set of x-rays, nobody will ever fault you for them, and you can kind of make sure that you're not missing fractures or other things um, in the patient. In terms of ordering an MRI, if you think, you know, if you think they've got an osteochondral lesion or you think the ACL is torn or the meniscus is torn or they've had a patella dislocation, go ahead and order that MRI, but I would not hold up going to see orthopedics to get that MRI. So you can certainly order it and send them to orthopedics, and if they have it when they get to see us, that's great, but you don't have to hold up going to see orthopedics to get it. Is there certain uh, symptoms or signs on examination or a history that would say, that would refer, refer or warrant a, a urgent referral, something same day or the next day? So anytime you have a patient where they can't bend their leg, so if their leg is stuck and they don't want to bend it or they can't put weight on it, things like that, um, that's something that you want to refer right away. Um, or if they have a loose body. So if you happen to get that MRI and you see it and there's a loose body in there or a bucket handle tear, things like that, you want to get that to orthopedics as soon as possible. Same with the tibial eminence fracture. Because of that fracture, it's important to put it back into position as soon as possible. Send that on over. Well, great. Thanks again, Dr. Holtman, for uh, joining us uh, uh, here today for your, your talk on knee pain and uh, young athletes. Uh, as we as we wrap up the uh, webinar here today, just a, uh, a couple of uh, uh, things want to bring to your attention again. Um, please don't forget to uh, watch for the email with a learner notification. Uh, that's important for the objective of the uh, course, uh, the disclosures, and most importantly uh, for for the link that gets you to the evaluation. Once you fill out that evaluation. Again, our accreditation uh, uh, body can get you the, the CME hours and a certificate for that. Uh, this year, you know, we, we provided a virtual course for you. I think it, we did a good job at providing multiple different aspects of uh, uh, orthopedic and musculoskeletal care uh, for you to, to learn from today. Uh, we certainly value and, and, and encourage you to give us your feedback on, on how this went for you. Uh, we, we would like to know information on what subjects you'd like to know, uh, kind of what, what can we add to our talks and presentations. Um, from a uh, standpoint on is there a time of day that's better than others? Uh, is there a time of the, a day of the week that's better than others? Uh, do you like this type of format where we do four hours at a time or should we do something different? I uh, really encourage you to give, that, give us that feedback so we can learn from this whole situation. Uh, also, encourage you to uh, uh, talk to your, your friends and colleagues uh, throughout the uh, profession. The, the way we get uh, our, our information out and get uh, the information to everyone is, is by word of mouth. Um, so, really appreciate that. Uh, if, uh, if you could help us out in that regard, uh, refer uh, your friends and colleagues to our website, stcloudorthopedics.com. Uh, our goal is to have a link there where you can, uh, where people can access. Uh, this uh, 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 webinar uh, on their own uh, on their own time at their own leisure uh, uh, throughout this next year up until the time 
uh, where, where we'll have our, our, our next annual uh, 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 meeting and uh, hopefully next time it will be live in person. Uh, we at St. Cloud Orthopedics are working hard to be your orthopedic provider of choice. Uh, we've been here since 1955. We provide multiple specialties with both operative and non-operative treatments. Uh, I really encourage you to uh, uh, keep us in mind when you're looking to refer our patients, whether it's a same-day service through our ortho direct or whether it's uh, uh, something more subspecialty referral. Uh, uh, we, we encourage you to think of us first. So thank you for joining us tonight, and we'll end the webinar here.